Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 Global Summit. My name is Shan Zhang, your 2021 Global Business Council Chair of the West Singapore Valley Realtors. I would like to thank you all for joining us here today. We are honored to have many of our colleagues from around the world to participate in our Global Summit every, uh, event today. In addition, I'd like to thank the panelists for giving us invaluable global real estate information. I would be remiss if I did not thank Yinber, NAR Director, and past president, as well as the WSGVR Global Business Council for putting this summit together. And finally, a special thanks to all of you for making this virtual event possible. The purpose of this global summit is to promote investment on real estate in Southern California and to reduce any international trading barriers. At the end of the event, you will have a better understanding of uh, the following uh, topics. One is how to obtain financing as a foreign national. Current global investment trends. How should one hold title while investing in the United States? And lastly, how to transfer funds to overseas after successful selling your property in the United States. We are very fortunate to invite a panel of outstanding speakers who will help guide you through the real estate process, as well as prepare you answer to the questions make arise from your clients during the real estate transaction. Today, I'm honored to present three distinct colleagues who are our moderators, Alex Lee, Mauricio Capatillo and Tom Sang. Just a few housekeeping tips, um, items before we start the program. Please be aware that all participants will be muted during the section. Should you have any question or comment, you can enter it into the uh, chat box. Throughout the summit, we will have raffles for each uh, gift cards. So please pay attention to the speakers and the chat box will have questions. Once you see the questions, try your best trying to answer, type in the answer as fast as you can. The first person who answered the question correctly will win a $25 gift card. We will also have the lucky drawing at the end of the summit. So please make sure to stay until the end of the summit section for a chance to win more gift cards. On behalf of the West Singapore Valley Realtors, we'd like to kick off um, the event with a video that introduced Southern California to our city. Southern California is the entertainment capital of the United States. From Hollywood movie productions to theme parks such as Disneyland, Universal Studios, Knott's Berry Farm, and Six Flags Magic Mountain. It is home to championship sports teams, the Los Angeles Lakers, LA Dodgers, and many fine golf courses. We offer many cultural opportunities, like the acclaimed Huntington Library and the Los Angeles County Arboretum. Because of our great weather, it is said that we can go to the many beautiful beaches to sun, swim, and surf, or head to the mountains to our local ski resorts, all in one day. And if you enjoy off-roading, we offer an abundance of terrain in our desert communities. We have the greatest education opportunities with USC, UCLA, UC Irvine, and Caltech, all within reach of the San Gabriel Valley areas. This opens the door to high-paying job opportunities. Our diverse communities offer a plethora of ethnic restaurant selections that should satisfy your taste buds, making everyone feel welcome and at home. The West San Gabriel Valley Realtors, established in 1922, prides itself in our education of members to be knowledgeable, ethical, and professional. We welcome our new friends from around the world with passion. 
When looking to buy a property in Southern California, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors is the preferred association to work with. Our diverse membership, representing over 3,000 Realtor members who are the voice of real estate, specializing in and serving the award-winning communities of Alhambra, Rosemead, Monterey Park, San Gabriel, Temple City, and beyond. We look forward to scheduling showings, guiding you through the inspection process, and helping you work with lenders that even offer foreign national programs. There are multiple property types available here in the San Gabriel Valley area, which include apartments, condos, high-rises, and single-family homes, all in varied price ranges. If you wish to invest in commercial, we'll have those opportunities too. There are many new hotels and various commercial opportunities, office buildings, retail shopping centers, and one of our thriving sectors, warehouses, being built right now with our city's growing needs. We take time to learn different cultures and your needs when it comes time for you to invest here in Southern California. We take pride in showing you our San Gabriel Valley area. We are tremendously proud of what we've accomplished. We are up for the challenge of helping you achieve your American dream. It is the measure of who we are and what we can do for you. Hope you all enjoy the Southern California video. This is all about California, what we have, what kind of products we have, what type of home we have, and uh, what we offer beaches, you know, with the um, our Universal Studio, all these entertainments. So with now, I'd like to have Alex Lee to introduce our speakers who will be speaking acquisition and exit strategy, all about loans. Alex, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Lee, and I will be introducing our next four speakers who are the experts in loan processing and acquisition. Let's remind everyone that if you have any question, please feel free to put them in the chat box and they will be answered at the end of each speaker. Please feel free to type in your question on the chat box and we will answer them after each speaker finished the presentation. In the meantime, we've had two questions in the chat box. Whoever gets those two questions first, with correct answer, will win a gift card. So please pay attention. The first speaker we have is, um, let me introduce Serene Yang, and a little bio about Serene. Serene is a senior premier mortgage loan officer at the CTBC Bank. And um, she has over nine years of experience and closed over 1,000, 1,100 cases. She has been awarded three consecutive years of sales, an excellent achievement in the branch. And uh, to mainly based in Irvine, she has experience working in a variety of locations in California. And she is able to, she talk, uh, she be able to use uh, Mandarin and English to connect and develop relationship based on communication with her clients. Her years of experience enhance her quick thinking and creative problem solving skill. Serene, take it over. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Serene. I am the law officer from CTBC Bank. I would like to thank South San Gabriel Valley Realtors Association for giving me this great opportunity to share the CDBC Bank Residential Mortgage Loan Program. Okay, there is going to have a lot of information to share to you. And I believe you guys will have um, many questions after my talk. So please write down all your questions and my contact information here. 
if you guys all see this um, the screen, right? And write down my information. I'll be happy to answer each of you uh, during our Q&A time or after uh, our meeting. Okay, today we all know it's, um, it's a sales market right now. So, and that's a little bit hard for and difficult to help your um, buyer to get their dream home. And my job here is making sure to assist each of your transaction to be successful. So you may have the client who also um, not sure if they are able to get along. So please just let me know. I'll be happy to help um, the client to prepare themselves and get a pre-qualification for them so they can go out to buy the house. Okay, so I'd like to share the program that we have from the CDBC. Okay, CDBC has many the different the loan program, but there's um, the two popular one I'd like to talk to you today. First is our uh, foreign national program. Okay, for this kind, okay, there's a two program I'd like to share today. One is called the foreign national. The other one is called no, no income document program. It's called, um, so that the client don't need to pre, pre, uh, prepare the income so they can still get along. Okay, first we'd like to talk about the foreign national program. For um, this kind of program, who will be the, uh, the person can be applied? Usually it's for the, um, the borrower who is a new immigration and they don't have a good credit or they don't have a credit in the state. And also they are not uh, the permanent resident from the state. And also there are just um, B1, B2 visa or they're students, they are L1s. For those people who is not have a credit in the state, they can apply for this kind of uh, the loan program. So for them, how are we gonna verify um, their income in the state? So we can allow them to use their own income from their own country. For example, we have a client who is at the job in China, in Taiwan, Thailand, a different country, and they can just use their um, the employment later from their own company. This is provide us that, the, you know, the document saying that how much they made. We don't even need to check the bank statement. We just need them, the HR to provide a letter. And uh, also they need to provide the business license from their company and also the HR's business card. It's pretty easy. And also because they don't have the credit in the United States, but we also allow to use their credit from their own country. For example, like uh, the China, they do have their own credit report system, but we do allow to use it. So instead of using the, they don't have a, this, uh, the credit in the state. So we just use the, um, their credit document from their own country. Or some of the, comp uh, some of the uh, country, they don't even, don't, they don't even have um, the credit report system. And no need to worry. We also accept the credit reference What's the credit reference? It can be the credit card company says, um, this client who has a, a, the credit card for so and so and then for like either one year, two years and no bad credit. So just the letter from the, um, the credit card company will also take that. It's so pretty easy, right? And the, what kind of access document that we need? Okay, we need this client to have a two months bank statement in the state. But if they have the bank statement in their own country, we also take that. So when they transfer the money to the state, we can trace back. So, oh, this is from the Hong Kong, from this bank. And we have a Hong Kong bank statement. And we also allow to use that. Okay. Is that, am I too quick? Am I okay? You guys all get it? Well, you're doing fine. So <laughs> oh, making Wait. sure you guys really get it. And not too fast, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Also, let's talk about the um, the assets program. This one's a pretty popular right now because we know the foreign national they are really decreased a lot from you know previous previous years. But right now we do have a lot of um, 
the as uh, the the okay the the client who is U.S. citizen or they are green card holder, they do have a the good assets background, but they do not have a good income, right? But we can also help them to get the loan. Okay, how are we gonna help them for that? Okay, so the um. The, also, the foreign national can also use this access program. Okay, this is very easy. We only need the one month bank statement for the down pay. Only need a one month bank statement, and uh, also uh, we also need the uh, you know some of the supporting document like they if they have a um, the the assets in their own country, they just give us um, transaction history or give some certain of the document and. For the, the people who's here, if they have um, the stock, they have an investment account, they have a 401k, we can always always use that as their you know, supporting document for the assets. So it's a pretty easy and very popular. For those two kinds of the, um, the loan program, it's the most popular in our uh, bank right now. So um, for our bank, we like, you know, the video says, um, you know, the San Gabriel Valley had a tons of the single family house, the condos and, and the one to four units. We can all to do, we can all to do that kind of the, uh, the property. So CDBC is allowed it to do those property. And we also allow to, the occupancy can be primary, can be second home, can be the investment. For our bank, we also allowed to have the, uh, the program. We have a three years amortization and we have a one year arm, um, three year arm, um, and the five year arm. Um. So that's the most popular the programs that we have right now. Um, oh, the most important thing, the RLTV is up to the 60% of the your purchase price. And we also allow to do the refinance. So if the client, oh, so, well, for the, you guys don't do it. <laughs> you guys don't care about refinance, right? So just for the purchase. So we can do up to the 60% and we can go up to the 5 million. So that's, uh, you know, quite a lot. I don't believe this as many banks can do that. So we can do up to 5 millions. The most important, important things that we can do 30 days closing or less. So we speed up. I know because it's really hard for the sellers market. So everybody is bidding for the house, right? So seller always wanted to have a, the short transaction. We can do it 30 days or shorter. The, the shortest I had in my record is 17 days. So um, 30 days closing. And also we can do the seven days to get the underwriter loan approval. So it's very, you know, help, uh, helps and speed it up. And the next, like we can do all of the North California, uh, South California, Hawaii, New York, New Jersey. So if you have um, the client like to do those area, you can also contact me and let me know. All right. So I know it's pretty quick and there's so many information. So um, I would like to um, open our Q&A time. And also, oh, forgot the one thing, the very important that you guys may interesting about the rate, right? <laughs> our interest rate can low as like 3.5, to five, it's at the range. It depends on the their status, their visa, mm -hmm. and their you know different the qualification. So it can be very. So if you have any clients that you are not sure about it, you can always talk to me and let me know. There's something I can help to make them, you know, to move over. Okay, so um right now um, I would like to move to the um, Q and A time. I don't know how that's gonna work. So if anyone can tell me. Yeah, yeah, sure, Celine. Okay. And thank you for a very informative presentation. And um, I know you mentioned something about other than California, you have some other other states that you can do the loan. But uh, so we have a question from uh, Denise Lowe. Uh, do you also offer the loan program other than California? So can you specify which state that you guys also offer? Please. Yes, um, as I say, there is um, Hawaii, New York, and New Jersey. We only lending for the um, the area that we have a branch on it. 
Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, any other question? I don't see it in the in the question and answer box or the chat box. Or anybody else um, that had any question? Hi, Serene. We do have a few questions in the chat box. Um, however, I, know, I try to. Yeah, I try to read them over. Screening, though, uh, please enter in the chat box so we can move on to our guest speaker and the program since we're short on time. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Okay, so you asked about what's the typical interest rate for the assess program? Assess program, okay, as I say, it can be 3.5 to um, 4.5. How about the gift fund accepted? Yes, yes. We allow the 50% um, of the down pay and can use it as a gift fund. Thanks, a good question. Okay, the next question from Risu is, uh, what's the maximum loan amount for the CCBC loan program? To 5 million, yeah. Okay, I guess that's, that's all the questions that I see. Well, thank you. Thank you, Serene. Thank you. Okay, now uh, with my pleasure, we, I'm going to introduce our second speaker is um, Joe Lamb from Loan Direct. Joe's career has been spent over 30 years in structure finance with total transaction over 16 billion. As a founder and CEO of Loan Direct, his mission is to deliver sustainable home ownership by offering finance solution to the non-bankable home buyers. As founder and CEO of Azura Holdings, his mission is to deliver safe and sound investment solution to investors in the area of structural finance, real estate development, and speculation, both in the US as well as Southeast Asia. Joe, take it over, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, the board, for the opportunity to be here today. It's an honor uh, to share some information about uh, Loan Direct and the program that we have to the foreign buyers. I'm going to share a couple of uh, slides here. So the uh, the current trend of the marketplace is that there's a uh, obviously there's a uh, increase in demand for the foreign buyers coming into the U.S. markets, and that has to do with the COVID, of course. Um, before 2019, we, uh, I think U.S. saw about 77 billion dollars of, uh, of real estate being purchased by foreign buyers, and of course, because of COVID, that has stopped for about 18 months. In 2021, we've seen a surge of demand for foreign buyers. And we have found that largely a lot of people who inquires have seen the impact of COVID and where they live. And you know, I'm from uh, Vietnam, for example. And if you are well-to-do in Vietnam, if you're multimillionaire in Vietnam, you live very well. And I'm sure that's pretty much uh, across the, the world. However, with the uh, COVID, a lot of those people have seen that perhaps they're, um, um, they're not mobile or, or freely as we are in the United States. So they start to realize that perhaps it's not just a lifestyle, but the freedom uh, is also important to them. So having a home in the U.S., having the ability to spend some time here is also important. Uh, there are people that have came here for the, uh, for the vaccine support. So I think COVID, in a sense, uh, even though it's pretty bad worldwide, but it does stimulate uh, a lot of foreign buyers. Um, and we've seen, again, about 300% increase um, in 2021. Now, um, prior to the, uh, uh, the COVID time, uh, you know, 2018, what have you, a lot of buyers are, uh, have been paying cash from China, Vietnam, uh, all of the Asia, uh, India is included. They love cash purchase. And what we have seen in recent years is there's a lot of countries that limit the amount of money that can bring out of the country. Uh, I know we all widely know that uh, China limit $50,000 per uh, transaction that is given out to uh, family members here and so forth. So if you are to buy a million dollar home, of course, that's gonna take a long time to transfer that million dollar. And the same for Vietnam, and even for a country that don't have restriction like Thailand or Philippines, it does take quite some time to transfer. Uh, I had a case where uh, one of my clients needs to transfer $400,000 from the Philippines. Uh, he used HSBC, which is an international bank. But when he went to the bank, um, they allow him to transfer $35,000 a day. Well, obviously $400,000 and do that uh, at $35,000 a day, that would be quite limited. And therefore we were late on closing 
Uh, obviously, that seller didn't like that too much. Uh, just recently, just last week, we had a buyer who transferred four hundred thousand dollars from Thailand to the title company because it's gift fund to her daughter. Well, title company rejected it because it did not come from the the buyer's name. So therefore, we have to reroute it to the buyer. Long story short, the challenge of transfer international money is uh, extremely difficult, and you have to be very careful with that. Uh, so having said that, a lot of buyers now opted to finance because obviously it's a lot easier to transfer $300,000 on a million-dollar purchase than transfer the million-dollar. Uh, so therefore, we have our foreign national program. Now, we know that out of the uh, countries outside of the U.S., the guidelines are pretty loosely because we don't know you know, what each country has and so forth. So pretty difficult to establish any employment, any income verification, or even credit verification. Um, so we have designed our foreign buyer programs to make it extremely in, uh, simple. Uh, we first need to get a valid passport. Of course, we've got to know who they are. Um, that's always important. Uh, we do require a 30% down payment. That payment obviously needs to be sourced. In other words, that has to be in their bank in their country. And typically most people who are well-to-do, they do use bank in their countries. And I'm talking about um, a lot of the countries that we've been doing business with, um, they have pretty standard banking system similar to what we have here. The uh, requirement with the down payments, we do ask they bring to the United States 30 days prior to closing. And one of the reasons for that is as we have experienced the fact that as through the escrow process, they don't have the time to bring it over. So we do request that they do they bring it over 30 days prior to closing because most of it is 30 days, right? Uh, credit requirement, uh, again, there's no standardized credit system outside of the United States, except for some of the four uh, Europe countries and uh, Canada and so forth. We actually don't use credit at all. No credit required. We do need a letter of reference from their bank, their financial institution. And again, most countries, if you have money in the bank, they will write a pretty brief letter for you stating that you have been a bank customer for two or three years with good standing. That is all that we need. So our loan programs is extremely simple to do. Uh, because the fact that it's quite simple, most of our foreign national programs can be done in three weeks time. The three weeks time is to allow for the appraisal, uh, and that typically is all we need. Um, now, I'm sure you're, gonna, you're probably asking what kind of terms. We are doing a 30-year term, and typical rates runs around four and a quarter to 5% depends on the amount of down payment. Obviously, the more down payment you put, the better rates gonna be. Um, and uh, these loans have a one-year prepayment penalty, which means that they would have to wait one year before they can pay it off or refinance it. Um, that's basically wrap up our loan program because we actually made it very simple. So therefore there's not much in here to discuss. Now, uh, as far as footprint, we do lend outside of California in about 24 states. Most of the states that we lend in is basically the U shape of the United States. Um, we lend in the uh, states that where the real estate is healthy. So example, California, Texas, Florida, um, Atlanta, Georgia, and so forth. Um, you can get a list from, um, from our website, uh, or we can actually send that to you. Uh, that's basically uh, the end of our program. Any uh, question or concern, I have my contact information on here. Um, either my cell phone or email would be the best to reach me. All right, so uh, question and answer, anyone? Uh, Thank you, Joe. And um, we do have a couple of questions. Do you require PITI reserve for the foreign national program? Great question. We do require six months PITI reserve in the United States. And also, is the program 30 year fix or AOM? It is a 30 year fix. And somebody, by the way, somebody just requested the contact information. So I'm going to reshare the screen. Can you also, Joe, can you also put your uh, contact information on the screen again? So yes. to remind yeah. everyone. So the contact information is, is back on. Okay. Anyone else have any question for um, Joe Lam from Long Direct? Okay, I guess um, you make your program so simple. I guess everybody understood very clear. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Okay, the pressure now, we, um, I'm going to introduce John Chow from um, Cathay Bank. He's a, a, a AVP of the Regional Mortgage Loan Officer. 
He's been in the banking industry for over 20 years and over 10 years in the mortgage loan experience in Cate Bank. John also speaks Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. He would like to assist domestic and foreign investors to achieve their real estate investment goal in the U.S. This is John. Oh, hi, good morning all. Uh, this is John Zhao from Kasei Bank uh, Mortgage Department. Um, Kasei Bank is a U.S. commercial bank. Uh, we service the customer since from 1962. Now we have 60 branches in uh, all eight states in the U.S., including California, Washington, Texas, Nevada, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey. And we also have one branch in Hong Kong and two offices in China and one office in Taiwan. Uh, we do loans for the customer from uh, the loan amount from 10,000 to 10 million. It depends on the customer's need. And the processing time now is uh, 45 days for purchase. Uh, last month, our average processing time um, is around uh, eight, uh, 38 days in West Coast. For the East Coast, we will complicate a little bit because that New York uh, tax us, so we need to complete transaction in attorney office, so we take longer. Today, I'm going to introduce two loan programs here. The first one we call Home Mortgage Plus, which means is for the local person, the customer no need to provide that or 1099. Uh, the customer may provide the employment letter uh, for um, the, the shows that they have a sufficient uh, income to support their uh, repay capability. And the customer also can provide uh, the liquid asset or real estate assets to support the, um, the loan. And other one is we call this non-resident mortgage loans. This loan is good for the foreign investors or the uh, international students in the United States. Uh, we will talk about it later. For the non-resident mortgage program features, the maximum loan amount is 2.5 million. It could be used for investment or second home. For this uh, loan, the customer needs to legally live in the United States no more than six months. Usually they will take that um, tourist visa or something like that. But if the customer do ha uh, if the customers do have um, green card or planning to apply for green card to stay in the United States uh, more than six months, this program is not suitable for them. Uh, gift funds. Uh, we do allow the customers to receive gift funds, but for the purchase, they're supposed to have their own funds first. Um, the own fund, we have a two, a three sections for the own funds. The first one will be the 5% of the purchase price. The second one will be the PITI reserve. We will talk about it later. The third one will be the uh, closing cost. The customer can receive gift fund for down payment and need to be in from their immediate family members and up to four gift funds uh, received. We, the customer have um, two options for this program. One is called full dog, one is called access only. For full dog, the customer just need to provide us employment letter from their current employer. The employment letter should also state that uh, the customer name, position, uh, employment history, and the past two years, their annual income, and this uh, for the current year, they need to uh, provide that uh, year to date income, monthly income. At the bottom of the employment letter, um, it should be signed by the human resource representative and date and provide a phone number and the address. And that for the full doc, the down payment will be 65%, uh, the down payment will be the 35%, and the refinance is the same. If this is a cash out refine, uh, there will be 50% LTV and up to 1 million. For reserves, we will ask the customer to provide 12 months PITI reserve and plus HOA fees. And um, for the, uh, the uh, reserves, if the customer says, um, I have foreign bank account, can I provide to you? Yes, they can provide, but after the initial review, or we call the conditional loan approval notice issued, they need to transfer those funds from um, the foreign bank to the US because we could not verify that funds uh, is real or not. For the loan program, we have 15 years fixed, 30 years term uh, arm loan, three years fixed or five years fixed. Today's interest rate for the 15 years fixed is 4.5%. Uh, for three years, it's 
25%, and for five years, it's 4.5%. If the customer says, I'm a retired or I'm an international student, yes, we do have another option. It's assets only for the uh, foreign loan. But the down payment will be 40%. The customer could provide 24 months PITI reserve. I have to say something about the PITI reserve. PITI here, maybe some um, get, um, no familiar with PITI reserve. We call it is um, monthly bank payment, interest, tax, insurance, and plus HOA if it applicable. And for the cash out refund will be up to $1 million and 50% LTV. And the loan program will be the same, 15 years fixed, uh, three years fixed, or five years fixed. The interest rate will be the same for 15 years fixed. Today's interest rate is 4.5%. And five years is 4.5%. And three years is 4.25%. And for this program, it's good for one to four units, um, family properties. And the maximum loan about 2.5 million. And the customer needs to have their own fund, like a 5% down payment. When the customer submit the application, they need to show us they have sufficient own fund there. For example, like they need to show us one month bank statement so that they have 5% of purchase price uh, deposit in their account and 12 months uh, PITI reserve or 24 months PITI reserve in their account and plus closing cost. From some customer, if they have um, uh, real, uh, uh, real estate properties in the US, if they're going with the non-resident or access, on, uh, access only loan, they can use that US real estate properties equity to offset that 12 months PITI reserve. Means that they just need to provide 12 months uh, liquid assets for, uh, for reserves. For the second mortgage program, we call the home mortgage pass program is typically good for the local person. They have social security number. Um, we will check the customer's uh, credit score. They need to be clean. The minimum credit score requirement will be 690. Uh, they should suppose in the past 12 months, they have no more, um, they have no bad record. For example, like a default or late pay in their mortgage history. Uh, this program is good for primary residents or second home. The down payment requirement will be 30% for owner occupied and 35% for investment. Uh, the customer also could receive the gift funds and up to four gift funds for the down payment from their immediate family members. They also need to provide us gift letter. Uh, we have a sample of gift letters if they need just need the donor and the mortgagee to sign on it. And we for this program, we have two underwriting method. One is called income, where another one is called assets only. For the income, the customer either could provide us tax return 1099, but it's not necessary. They also can provide employment letter from their current employer. The current employer uh, supposed to sign the employment letter and uh, state that the customer name, position, uh, employment history, and state that the past two years annual income in the company and the current month, uh, monthly income and the current year to daily income. And the uh, employer or the human resource uh, clerk is supposed to sign the letter, leave their name, phone number, and address. The bank may call back to verify the employment. And uh, for the down payment, it's 30% down payment. For the cash out refund, it will be the same with that uh, last one. The last program is 50% cash out and up to 1 million. If the customer could provide employment letter, the reserve will be six months PITI reserve plus HOA fees. If they could not provide an employment letter, for example, say I'm retired or I'm unemployed. Yes, they still can do the loan, but they need to provide 24 months PITI reserve uh, plus uh, HOA fees. And uh, if the customer already have other uh, real estate properties in the U.S. stage, and then they can use that 12 months PITI reserve with that um, real, estate, real estate property equity. For the program will be 15 years fixed. Today's interest rate is 4.375. For uh, We have 30 years term, three years fixed, and five years fixed arm loan. 
for this arm loan, five years arm loan, today's interest rate is 4.375. And for three years, it today is 4.125%. And uh, for FICO, I have to say that for this program, it's pretty straightforward. The underwriter will focus on the customer's uh, credit report and the bank statement. Uh, if for the credit report, make sure the customer doesn't have any collection, late pay, or mortgage default in the past 12 months. If they do, that would be a problem. And uh, for the uh, PITI reserve or reserve, like say if the customer could provide the employment letter, then six months PITI reserve must be the liquid assets. For 24 months PITI reserve, 12 months must be the liquid asset, either checking account, CD or savings account or investment account or 401k or IRA should be fine. The other 12 months could be could be the non-liquid assets such as real estate equity. Um, for this program, max two loans for each borrower. Um, so this program is pretty straightforward. The point is, if you got a clean bank statement, if you got the assets, if you can get that um, employment letter. This is my contact information. Before the customer submit the application, I strongly recommend that the, either the router or the customer contact the branch first, the loan officer first, before they submit the application or go outside to submit the offer. Because it's case by case, but each loan application will not be the same. Um, I have been dealing with hundreds loan application, no one will be the same, exactly the same. Um, so I suggest customers to be here and show that bank statement and planning when they can transfer the fund from, um, even though they're from uh, overseas a bank to US, because for um, non-resident loan or some even is local person or borrower, they, they deposit the fund in others uh, countries uh, for example, like uh, South Korea, Vietnam, China, even though I heard from Hong Kong, they still have to trend, uh, foreign currency policy. They have problem recently to transfer fund from there to the US. So that would be a better idea to contact your local branch mortgage loan officer and before you submit the application. For each Kasei bank, branch, we have at least one mortgage loan officer uh, there and can serve the customer. Um, at the end, um, if the customer or if anyone have question, just let me know here. Thank you, John. Okay, now um, thank you for the good information on Cafe Bank, the loan program. Um, right now we have a few questions and you can also post your uh, on the screen, your information on the screen, John, so people can um, take a screenshot at it if they have any more questions later. Um, the question we have is from uh, Judy Charles. She say, how to calculate assets depletion, 36 months or 84 months? For, is for uh, assets, we will check the customers. Uh, we will check the pop. Actually, we will start to check the property record and make sure that the property is under the customer's name. And the second, because we, we, we don't know the customers, how much they want to borrow and how much PIT they need to reserve. So usually if they have a real estate property, it's not in the state bank, the same bank, that will be easy to qualify. It's case by case. So you have to contact the, uh, the loan officer to discuss this. I see another question here is that how many states in Kaste Bank located? We have a states and um, including California, Washington, Texas, Nevada, Illinois, Maryland, New York, and New Jersey, Texas. And we have one branch in Hong Kong. It's, it's a bank branch and two offices in China and one office in Taiwan. Okay, thank you. And also uh, from Peter Lam, um, can foreigner bring in funds by wire direct from outside of US to the ESCO? Uh, yes, they can, but well, usually I would not recommend to, to do so. You know what? Um, they can. They can wire the fund from there to ASCO directly for the down payment, right? Uh, because once we put it in ASCO, the fund no longer controlled by the buyer. It's controlled by the ASCO buyer and seller, right? If something happened, they need to talk to the seller. 
to get back the fund. Yes, they, they, at, the, at the closing or before that final approval, they can uh, send a wire to uh, ESCO directory, yes. Yes, okay, can you post your contact again? What about the fee? The fee, um, we have origination fee, 980 since from August 2nd. Uh, the customer need to also need to, um, we well, they will charge uh, credit report fee is $29 and twenty-nine dollars and twenty-four cents or forty-four cents, something like that. And there will be appraisal fee. Uh will be five hundred and fifty and up. It depends on the appraisal company. But usually in R1 area, there will be six hundred to seven hundred dollars. There will be eleven dollars of a flood certificate. And make sure that the subject property is not in the flood zone. Otherwise, they need to buy a FEMA insurance. Uh, that would be $11. And we will charge $70 for tax service. So around here will be under 1,600 something. And the customer will also need to pay that ASCO and title. Uh, that's almost there. Okay, thank you. Okay, also um, we have a question to ask from Peter. Uh, can foreigner LLC company apply for the loan? No, not for a residential loan. LLC needs to be go with um, commercial program, not for the mortgage. Okay, I guess that's all the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank James. you. Okay, now we hear all this um, loan program and the last, uh, is we need to get this money into the US and um, or vice versa. So we have uh, our last speaker uh, for this presentation is Eva Slacheva. Um, she's a business development manager for Money Corps. She originally from Bulgaria. Eva came to the US at the age of 12 and her passion for the horses took her all over Europe, Canada and the US. Eva joined the Money Corps team in 2014 and was instrumental to, in the company expansion throughout the US Specializing in personal transfer, Eva has been directly working with individuals buying or selling properties internationally, emigrating, moving inheritance or pension, or simply covering overseas living expenses. She is based in the Florida offices and currently manage relationship with some of the Money Corp's top referring partners. Take it over, Eva. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you to the board for having me. It's, it's a real honor to be here today. Thank you for all the information so far. I know we have little time, so I'll try and get through as, as quickly as possible and give you the most relevant information to, to help you and your clients. Um, so what, oops, everybody see my, my screen okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'll jump right into it as quickly as I can. Apologies that my presentation is doing crazy things. Here we go. Um, if you have not heard of, of Money Corp before, all we do all day every day is currency exchange and international payments. The majority of our clients are either buying properties and bringing money into the U.S. or selling those U.S. investments and repatriating money back home. Anytime your clients work with a currency exchange company, instead of using the bank, chances are they're saving uh, quite a lot of money. Banks are fantastic for everyday banking, but not so much when it comes to currency exchange, especially US banks on the US side. Um, I do encourage you to take a look at Money Corp um, later, take a look at our website, learn a little bit more about us. We're one of the largest and most established currency exchange companies out there. We do have teams in 11 different countries. And last year we traded about 59.5 billion in about 120 different currencies. So chances are most places we can help your clients and their transfer needs. These are some of the locations where we have teams and offices. And our website has incredible amounts of information, not just on our services, but also market and weekly updates. If you're ever wondering why the US dollar is moving in one direction or the Canadian dollar is moving in another, you can always check in there and find lots of useful information. Our team is always coming up with new property guides 
and different reasons that your clients may need us besides buying or selling property. Besides individuals, it's worth noting that we can also help businesses and corporations that have needs to move money to and from the US or within between other countries. Um, a lot of our international investors do like to invest in the US under an LLC, under a business, so we can certainly accommodate these types of transfers. This is the biggest question that I, that I get daily. Why not use my bank? I don't get it. Why use MoneyCorp? Why use a currency exchange company? Um, the, there's two reasons. Banks have two sets of fees. One is the international wire fee. It's usually a flat fee, bank country to country. A lot of the time clients believe that that's all they're paying to make an international transfer. It's not true. The real profit made is actually the margin taken on the exchange rate. And a lot of the time working with a bank, it's not quite clear to a client what that margin is, how much they're actually paying to transfer money internationally. Working with a currency exchange company, you're not only getting a far more competitive rate of exchange than the bank, you're avoiding international wire fees a lot of the time as we have local accounts in different countries, but you do get that personal help. You have a dedicated currency dealer that's assigned to each client. That way your buyer or your seller can begin planning for their upcoming transfer of funds. We can give them information on the exchange rate movements. We can help them target a better rate of exchange the earlier we start. For example, if you have a buyer who knows he's gonna purchase in six months or a year's time, we'd love to get in touch with them. That's not too early because the earlier we begin watching the exchange rate movements, the earlier, uh, the more opportunities we have to help your clients save money. They can pre-book part of the money, they can pre-exchange it, they can hold it on account with us and every little bit of savings counts. With MoneyCorp, there's different ways to secure an exchange rate. We can do a watch order where we help your client target a favorable move in the, in the market. We can do a limit order where we automatically secure an exchange rate once the exchange rate of their choices is available. And we have a lock-in option where we can lock into a rate of exchange for up to two years time. And a lot of our international investors have really enjoyed that option, especially with COVID and the drastic rate movements that the market saw in the past year. Opening a MoneyCorp account is quick. It's easy to do. Most of our clients do it online. It takes five minutes or so to establish an account. It's absolutely free and they can automatically get access to our online platform and get on the phone with a currency dealer. If for some reason they choose not to use our service, no harm, no foul. The account can close if there's no activity for up to two years time. But I always encourage clients to at least open the account, get informed, and at least get a quote from us and make a comparison with your bank to see how much you're saving. I'm going to give you a quick example to show you the difference between using MoneyCorp and using a bank, in this case, a bank in uh, France and Europe. Let's say Clarice is looking to purchase property in California for 500,000 US dollars. Clarice looks online, she sees that the euro dollar exchange rate is at 117. She heads over to our local bank, finds out that her local bank will give her a rate of 113. So now that property in California is costing her about 442,000 euros. If she opens a quick account with MoneyCorp and does a quick comparison, she can quickly see she's getting a far better rate. And now that property is costing 431,000 euros. So this is a very typical example for a client from Europe, in this case, making a comparison between MoneyCorp and their bank. In addition, Clarice is not paying an international wire fee because MoneyCorp has accounts in Europe. And every step of the way, we can show the flow of funds. We can show when Clarice sent funds to her MoneyCorp account, when Clarice exchanged it, and when Clarice sends it on to title. A lot of our clients request this, whether it's a mortgage requirement, a title requirement, a seller requirement, we can always show a very clear flow of funds. Some of our clients even use it for source of funds when required to prove that they have X amount of money available to make a purchase. Now, currency fluctuations are, are certainly worth noting. In this case, we'll take a look at Clarice buying that same property, but what if she planned a little bit earlier instead of waiting to the very last day to send the money? She knew she was buying this property, so if she had done the exchange on June 1st rather than today, the exchange rate was at 1.22, she would have paid 409,000 euros. But she waited till August 6th and she paid 427,000 euros. 
So there's always, going back to what I mentioned earlier, an, a chance to lock in that exchange rate when it's more favorable for your clients. And the earlier they begin the process of working with us, the more opportunity we have to help them save. Exchange rates are always ticking, always moving. Um, they're affected by many, many things. Obviously, in the last year, we had COVID. We had Brexit in the, in the United Kingdom and Europe. We had a U.S. presidential election. A lot went on. And all of that sort of craziness tends to make the U.S. dollar go up as U.S. dollar is considered one of the safe haven currencies. A high U.S. dollar prompted a lot of foreign nationals to start selling their U.S. properties. Why? Because they're getting a lot more bang for their buck when they convert those U.S. dollars back into their home currencies. 2021, we are seeing economies stabilizing. We are seeing the return of international investors. And to echo off of what Joe said, we are certainly seeing an increase in high net worth transactions as far as international investors go. Um, and another trend we're also noticing is Americans buying abroad. A lot, a lot going on. Now, I do want to mention sellers as that has been sort of the big uh, Thing that has kept Money Corp busy specifically and, and a, a lot of other companies as well. There's been a lot of foreign national selling. And I think it's so important to understand that process and to best guide your clients throughout that. So when a client is ready to sell, let's say Tim from Canada is selling his U.S. home, it's closing day, he has U.S. dollars that he's ready to, to send somewhere and the title company is going to ask him where Tim wants that money to go to. A lot of our foreign national clients will say, you know what, just send it to my US bank account. You know, I'm not even in the US. I don't, I don't need the money right now. I'll deal with it later. There's no trouble for the title company to do that. There's no trouble for Tim to, to make that request. The trouble comes a little bit later. When Tim decides to access that money from the US bank and decides to bring it back to Canada or bring it back to any other country he wants, that's when the problem comes. There's something called the US Patriot Act you are required to be physically present at your US bank when initiating a wire transfer. I'm speaking specifically to a large wire transfer. Your US bank will be happy to let you move 500 bucks there, a thousand bucks there, but a large chunk of money, they're gonna require you to be physically present to sign off on that transfer. And Tim's not there. A lot of our foreign national sellers are not here. So worth having that conversation with your clients prior to closing day so they can best prepare on how they're gonna access their money. I have mentioned this to realtors, to title companies, to clients. A lot of the time, the clients do not believe me or choose not to believe me that they can't access their own money in a U.S. bank. And then I get a phone call of, um, you know, apologies. And, and what do we do now? My money's stuck. So let's avoid that situation and warn your clients. Tim can also say to the title company, please go ahead and send it to my Canadian bank. I just want to receive it in Canadian dollars. Here's my information. Again, that can be done, but what happens on, in the background is the title company in the US is working with the US bank. That US bank is going to be the one to convert the US dollars to Canadian dollars. So the US bank is in charge of the margin. The US bank is making the profit on the exchange here. It's not up to the title company. It's not up to anyone else. No one's gonna check with Tim and say, Tim, are you okay with us charging you X, Y, Z? It's not going to happen. He's just going to receive Canadian dollars in his bank and it's going to be a lot less than what he should get. So again, worth having that conversation with your client prior to making that decision. Before closing day, Money Corp can help. And again, underline before closing day, um, call me day before if, if need be or morning of, I'll do my best to help. But we can open an account for Tim right away. We can provide the title company with US dollar account details in the US and Tim can easily receive his proceeds into his Money Corp account. Now Tim is in charge. If Tim wants to book the exchange same day and send it onto his account in Canada, fine, Money Corp will do that for him. He'll get a better rate, no transfer fees, and he's in charge of, of what, he's, what he's doing and how he's doing it. Tim also has the ability to tell to want to hold on to my money in US dollars. He can leave it on account with us for as long as he likes. And when he's happy with the exchange rate movement, he can book the exchange and transfer at that point. Almost all of our foreign national sellers choose to do this. They choose to hold funds on account and they use our team to target a good time in the market in the exchange rate to book that exchange and it can save them a significant amount of money. Whether that property is being sold under an LLC, trust, corporation, again, we can accommodate that. And a few months later, when FERC the money comes, again, that can go into the corp account as well. I'm going to skip through that slide because we just don't have a whole lot of time. 
Um, but I will simply leave you with, we do have a partner program where you can directly introduce your clients to myself, my team. We're gonna personally take them through the process, keep you updated on, on your clients' um, action, on their progress. And if you need, I can provide you with helpful links, whether it's for your website, whether it's for your blog, if you wish to target international clients, um, this can help you. Um, a lot of people put that on their website and then international leads come through and register for an account. And we do have a daily exchange rate email available. If you'd like that, call me, email me after the presentation. I'll get you signed up for it. It's nice to just take a glance at a few exchange rates in the morning and uh, help you in your conversations with your, with your clients later on. So these, this is my personal cell phone number. You can call text there. My email address as well, if you want any of the slides, if you wish for any information or have specific client scenarios you wanna discuss, by all means, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to help. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. I, I, hope I, I hope I finished on time. <laughs> Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Eva. You're doing great. Very good, very informative. You know, I learned quite a bit too about money crops, very, very detailed and uh, clear. And right now we go to the question and answer for uh, Eva. Anybody have any question for Eva? Please post it. I've covered everything. <laughs> okay, how many uh, states does money crop do business in? Can you apply? How many, how many states? How many, you said? Yeah, yes. All the states. We can help throughout any, any state. Um, we do have a list of uh, currencies and countries on our website, I believe, but I always encourage, um, you know, if you have a specific client or specific transfer need, call me, email me, I'll quickly take a look and let you know how and if we can help. A lot of the time with international investors, it's not so black and white. It's, I live here, but my money's coming from this country and I'm investing in this third country. So we're quite used to that and we can accommodate those situations. Um, so if anybody wants to discuss, let me know. The easiest way to introduce a client is really to copy me in on an email. I register the client under your name and I jump on assisting them right away. Um, it's as simple as that, really. Okay. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, does money Corp work with China where it has some transferring limit? Does that apply to money corps? Yes, yeah, so we, we can assist. It's just a little bit harder for us, meaning going back to that, to that uh, limit on how much they can send to us. Um, we can't change the rules of, of China. Um, so we have to, as much as the client can move out, we can, we can assist, um, but it is, it is difficult. We can't change the rules of certain countries. Not every country allows the free flow of their currency. Not every country allows a third party like Money Corp to assist because what that really means is the local bank in that country is not profiting on the exchange rate. Um, so we can help in a lot of places with China. It's, it, it's not a firm no, it's a situation by situation. Um, our, our compliance team will take a look and we'll quickly within half a day let you know yes or no if, if we can assist. A lot of the time, it's a matter of the currency. The local um, Chinese currency is not one that we can exchange, but a lot of our international investors from there have Hong Kong dollar accounts, and that's what they're using to do exchanges and transfers, in which case we can help. Um, but it always, always varies, and a lot of the time, the funds are, in, are coming from a different country. So that's why it's not a firm yes or a firm no. It's a really case-by-case -case situation. Okay. On the same token, how about uh, to Vietnam? Is it the same like China? would have to take that away because I've not checked on Vietnam recently. I can check with our compliance team and ask. It's not one that I get asked for every day, so I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but I'll certainly double check. If you'd like, I can send a quick email back to you or a quick email to, for you to share with the group. Um, but again, these things do change sometimes monthly, sometimes yearly based on politics, life, economics, a lot of things. So our compliance team will sometimes say we can help this month and next year we cannot help. So it really, really varies. Um, I believe we may be able to help with Vietnam. I will have to double check with my dealing team. Yeah, please, you can email me because yes, we do have course. a lot of fun. I'll make yeah, a to do that. Okay, thank you. Yes, Okay. Okay, now the next question we have is uh, any one-time charge for the transaction? 
there's no there's no charge to open the account. There's no transfer fee. Uh, there's no fee for us to receive funds. The only time that Money Corp that has any charge or makes any profit is only when we're converting one currency into another. It's always at a far better rate of exchange than a bank, and the client will know prior to booking or sending us any money exactly how much of their currency they're sending us, exactly how much U.S. dollars they're receiving. Our profit is always embedded into the quote provided. That way, there's no surprise for the client. We typically work off of a 1% margin or less on the exchange rate. So we try to stay as close as possible to the live rate of exchange that you would see on Google or Bloomberg, for example. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the next question we have is uh, for the partnership program, can you elaborate more? Yes, of course. So the, the partnership program is uh, a lot of real estate professionals are partners. Um, we have, we have uh, attorneys that are partners of ours, um, title companies. It could be anyone really that works in, and has international clients. Um, it gives that realtor, that person, an easy way to introduce their client to Money Corp and to stay updated on their client's progress. Uh, for example, let's say you're working with an international investor. Once you introduce them to me, to Money Corp, I keep you updated. Hey, your client opened an account. Hey, your client funded um, their Money Corp account. We're ready for closing. Hey, we transferred this amount of money to title company. So it takes a little bit of work off the realtor and it allows us to stay in touch with your client and walk them through the process. The more information you give me about what your client is doing, such as closing day amounts, et cetera, loans, the better I can help them and, and keep you updated along the way. We do have, as part of the program, we do pay referral fees, um, which is uh, for the lifetime of the client's account. Anytime they use us, we say thank you to the introducer and they can receive a referral fee as well. Okay, we had a last question here. And um, is the money FDIC insured? The money is held in a client safeguard account with Money Corp. We are not a bank. We're strictly a currency exchange and international payments company. Anytime clients have funds on account with us, it's held in a client safeguard account, which is completely separate from Money Corp's everyday operational finances. Um, it is 100% safe and guaranteed by Money Corp. We have, based on every country, um, the correct licensing, the correct security of client funds information on our website that anybody has access to. Um, and um, if, again, if, if it's a specific uh, requirement for a certain country, we, we certainly have it covered by our compliance team. We haven't lost money so far, thankfully, but one way that you can think of our client safeguard account is you can compare it to an escrow account that a title company has when you're spending money to buy or um, buyer seller's money is held. It's a very, very similar client safeguard account. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions and um, you can also post your information again. One more time and then um, and then we uh, look like we are done for this session um, now i would like to turn the floor over to our moderator Mauricio Capitello, who will introduce our next panelist to talk about immigration visa eb5 and foreign buyer in esco Mauricio, please take it away Thank you, Alex. My name is Mauricio Capetillo. I'm excited to introduce the next two speakers. They will give us a better understanding of where the global investment trends are headed. Please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and the speakers will answer them after they finish their presentations. In the meantime, we will have two questions in the chat box. Whoever correctly answers the questions first will win a gift card. So stay tuned and please pay attention. But before we introduce our speakers, I wanted to take a moment to spotlight three of our sponsors for today, all of whom were nice enough to provide the gift cards that will be given out throughout our event today. We have uh, Joseph Lamb of Loan Direct. Joseph, are you there? I am. Yes, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, what you can offer. Well, thank you, Mauricio, for the opportunity. Um, it's been a wonderful program. So briefly about Loan Direct, we are a specialty mortgage lender. Uh, we lend, as you can see, uh, in the foreign national buyers. We also lend to U.S. investors with no documentations required uh, at all. So we are a streamlined lender where you don't have to go through with mountains of paperwork. 
Uh, typically, most of our loans are credit and loan to value driven. So we go by FICO score and the amount of down payment you have. With that, we make a decision to lend based on your uh, 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 loan to value and based on the property condition. Uh, typical investor rate runs in the low four, around 4.1 to about 4.8. Uh, so very realistic uh, interest rate there. Uh, and aside from that, we do a lot of the non-permanent residents who are here on different type of visa, uh, F1, uh, H1B, um, uh, DACA, uh, ITIN. So a lot of the foreign uh, buyers who potentially are already in the, in the U.S. Some, and with some capacity, uh, we do lend on those as well. So that's uh, briefly about our company, what we can offer. And you can always reach out to me at the information on the screen. Uh, more specifically to your buyer's needs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joseph. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you again for your generosity. Um, we also have Karina Castrehi of KB Home. Karina, are you joining us today? Good morning. Good morning, Karina. How's everybody doing? Thank <laughs> yeah. you for having me. Can you guys see me? Oh, there we go. Okay, wonderful. Hi. There you are. Good morning, everyone. I'm Karina Castrehe, and I am from Katie Home, and I want to thank everyone for being on this call and um, well, for inviting me. And uh, I just kind of want to touch base a little bit about what's going on. Um, I am actually in a community in Upland, California. Um, it's called La Cresta. Um, we have actually two communities in the same place. Uh, one is La Cresta, one is Montera. It is right off of the 210 freeway and um, baseline. You cannot miss it. The wonderful thing about this community, it's right next door to Whole Foods. You have everything there. You have your, um, anything that you need. Your CVS is there, um, the Whole Foods is there, um, Starbucks, everything. And anybody that lives in that community will have a fob that they can walk. There's two little gates there that they can walk to the community. So um, I have some available properties, guys. So if you, did you have say anybody, inventory, did you say I inventory? Do. I have a couple of houses that we can actually close in about uh, two months. So Fantastic. if you have anybody, please let us know. And and remember, guys, everything you register at one community. Your commission's protected for all of Southern California. So make sure you register your buyers. Okay. Yeah. And you know what? And I can vouch for Karina. She is uh, an icon in the in the builder world. She is phenomenal at what she does. She recognizes the importance of real estate professionals. Uh, and uh, we're lucky to have you, Karina. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank really you. appreciate you. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll put your information uh, available or make your information available to the audience so that they can come visit you and then make a stop over there at Claremont Village because it's right it, there. Exactly. The right there. next to the, to the colleges, a great location. Fantastic. Cool. And the, the view is amazing. Yes. Yes. And I've seen it. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. So thank you again, Karina. Appreciate it. Thank you. you guys. Have a fantastic day. All right. Night. Take care. Take care. And I think Carlos, uh, Carlos, are you there? Did you join us? Thank you, Karina. I'm here. Thank you. Carlos, Carlos of Lewis Management Corp, uh, near and dear to my heart. Carlos, thank you for joining us and thank you for your generosity. Great. Just want to say hi. Just want to, we're the Lewis Group of Companies. I'm the business development manager, uh, the title formerly held by our dear Mauricio Capatillo, who's helped me uh, get into this role. I just want to share a couple of communities that we're building out um, in the Inland Empire. Uh, we've got Shady Trails over North Montana. They're building, uh, we've got four different builders out there completing that project. And um, you've got three communities that over the last three weeks have just launched. So there's some opportunity there for your home buyers. And then a second community we want to highlight um, is uh, the Preserve at Chino. We've got a lot of activity going on at the Preserve in Chino. You can go uh, right now and see just homes being built everywhere in that region as they continue to uh to develop uh, the region there um awesome. you want to you can go to two different uh websites to check these out um, the easy way is you can go to lewisbroker.com and then in the drop downs you can find these links or uh, and i think mauricio might have a slide later you've got um, shittytrails.com and you've got the preserve so we encourage you to 
check those sites out and see what um, there might be something for your clients to go check out. And Fantastic. Go Carlos, slide. thank you so much. Really appreciate your uh, generosity as well. And please thank the team for us. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for your generosity. We look forward to uh, a continued partnership with you all. Really, really important how we support each other. So thank you again. So uh, before I introduce our first speaker of the segment, please remember to ask your questions in the chat box as the speakers will be answering questions at the end of their presentation. Uh, our first speaker is Juliana Tu, escrow manager, Viva Escrow Inc. An escrow officer since 1977, Juliana Tu of Viva Escrow Inc. is one of the first escrow officers of Chinese descent in the state of California, whether paying it forward or giving it back. Juliana is committed to making a difference in the escrow industry. All industry partners like the real estate and mortgage industries and all the industries organizations, the California Escrow Association, the American Escrow Association and the Escrow Institute of California. This commitment has led to various positions which have helped her fulfill her goals. And in 2019, she was the first and hopefully not the last Chinese American president of the California Escrow Association. Juliana is a member of the Escrow Advisory Committee of the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, previously known as the Department of Business Oversight. And she's a member of the Los Angeles County Assessors Advisory Council. She published her book, The Art of Escrow in 2012. During the 2020 pandemic, she took on a new project and is continuously working to put all her knowledge into YouTube videos under her channel, Think Escrow. She also has her own website at juliana2.com. In case you're interested, the professional designations behind her name are for certified senior escrow officer, certified escrow officer, certified bulk sale specialist, and certified escrow instructor. She is also a senior American settlement industry professional as conferred by the American Escrow Association. For Juliana, it, her motto has always been to pay it forward. Knowledge and experience do not mean anything if it is not used for the benefit of others or not passed on to the new generation of escrow officers. Please help me welcome Ms. Juliana Tu. When we have a transaction and it looks like there could be foreign sellers, we start out by asking them or their agent the following question. Question number one, are the clients foreigners? If the answer is no, then we give a big sigh of relief and all we need to do is have them complete the foreign investment in real property. Are you there, Juliana? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, there you are. Okay, can you see yeah, my screen? We, we got you. Okay, should I start from the beginning? Yeah, why don't you? All right then. When we have a transaction and it looks like these could be foreign sellers, we start out by asking them or their agent the following question. Question number one, are the clients foreigners? If the answer is no, then we give a big sigh of relief. All they need to do is complete the Foreign Investment in Real Property Act, the FRIPTA form, and we are off to the races. If the answer is yes, then we have question number two. Do they have a US tax ID number? If they say yes, then we give a smaller sigh of relief. They may not be able to sign the FRIPTA form, but it's one less worry for us. If the answer to the second question is no, then the FRIPTA process just got a little bit more complicated. So I would like to take this time to give you a rundown of this process from the escrow holder standpoint. And here's a list of the topics that I will talk about in this time period that I have. The importance of tax identification numbers. How do we calculate withholdings? Can we reduce the withholdings? Closing the escrow and doing the withholdings? What happens after the closing or during the closing? Some tips to think about and share with others and the California withholding. You can imagine how important it is to have a tax identification number. Without it, how would the withholding, where would the withholding amount be placed? How would the client claim it back? So this is what you should recommend to your client if he does not have an ITIN number. Unless you are a qualified tax preparer, go through a tax preparer who has experience doing this. Start the application process just as soon as possible as all the requirements needed has to be obtained. For instance, 
a certified copy of a foreign passport. And this is not just some regular certification. A certified copy can only be attained by a special certified acceptance agent at the IRS or elsewhere. And not all IRS locations have them. We need a completed W-7 application form and a copy of the purchase contract, okay? So it's going to take three to four months to get this item. So you need to get started. Now, unlike the franchise tax board withholding, which I'm gonna talk about a little later, the fructo withholding has nothing to do with the property being the seller's principal residence or not. It has everything to do with the, whether the seller is a foreigner or not. If the buyer is an individual and he signs a buyer's declaration that he or members of his family will use the property as his principal residence, 50% of the number of days that the property is actually in use for the first two years, then the withholding, which is on the sales price, is gonna be as follows. Under 300,000 sales price, there's no withholding. Between 300,001 and 1 million, it's gonna be 10% of the sales price. And over a million, it's going to be 15% of the sales price. Remember, if the buyer cannot or will not sign this declaration, then all withholding is going to be at 15%. No ifs, ands, or buts. Can we reduce withholdings? Sure. The client can request but they have to have an ITIN number or they are in the process of obtaining one. See, this is why the ITIN is so important. Have the client obtain a qualified tax preparer. The client is going to need to submit 8288-B form. They're going to provide a copy of their present purchase agreement, a copy of their original closing statement when they purchased the property, and a copy of their present sale estimate closing statement so that they can show the approximate amount of the gain. And if they are approved, the IRS will issue a reduced withholding letter with the amount they calculated needs to be withheld. Again, it will take three to four months to get approval. Here's a copy of the 8288-B form, Application for Withholding Certificate. What happens at closing? Withholding will have to be sent out no later than 20 days after the closing, or there will be late penalties. Mind you, the late penalty is not chump change. It is 25% of the withholding amount. And if it's on a $1 million sale price, sale price of 15%, the penalty could be $37,500. Escrow will need to submit the check with the forms 8288, which is, by the way, signed by the buyer, and forms 8288AB coupons to the IRS. And on the boxes in the 8288AB coupons, we reflect the foreign tax ID number as applied for. Can we close without the ITIN? Yes, as long as the seller is willing to allow us to send the IRS the full 10 or 15%, no later than the 20 days after the day of closing. Yes, then we can close escrow. Again, we will reflect the foreign tax ID number as applied for on the forms. Can we close if we do not have a reduced withholding? Yes, but the client or their tax preparer will need to provide me with proof that the request was made. I would like to get a copy of a registered mail return receipt or something like that. And of course, the client is going to have to allow me to withhold the entire 10 or 15% amount in escrow after closing until the reduced withholding letter is received. Here's a shot of the 8288AB coupon form. It has, you see, copy A, copy B. It's a small form and it'll have the client's name. They'll have the name of the buyer. They're going to have the foreign address, but this is the important address, the mailing address of the person that we're withholding on. So this is the 8288AB coupon form. 
It is not 8288-B, by the way. I don't know why they named these forms these similar names. It's a bit confusing. So what happens after closing? And this is when the client has to be aware of the following. If you don't have an ITIN, the IRS is going to send the client at the address listed on the 8288-AB coupon, a letter stating that the ITIN is needed before they can acknowledge that the funds were received on his behalf. They will, once they get it, get the 8288B coupon stamp received, and they will mail this back to the client or their representative on the designated address of the form. The foreign company, the foreign client will then file his income tax return when the time comes in and include this stamp received 8288B coupon form. Now, please remember, the client should always give the escrow a mailing address in the U.S. where he will receive all correspondence especially if it's coming from the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board. Do not use a foreign address. These government agencies do not add additional postage to send out paperwork to an international address. So on the copy 8288, they will sign, they will send the, the, the B form back stamped received, and it will go to this mailing address, as you can see right here. Here are some tips and reminders that I'd like to share, and hopefully it will help you or your clients. Always ask the client to get legal and financial counsel. I don't have to tell you this, but I want to remind you, you do not want to be responsible or liable for this whole process because we could be talking a lot of money. Always use a qualified tax professional with getting the ITIN or the reduced withholding. Now, not all escrow agents handle crypto withholding. Some companies have management policies that will not allow them to do so. So be sure you call your escrow agent first before you open the escrow to make sure that they are knowledgeable enough to do this. Check the FRIPTA form as soon as it comes in. I tell it to my escrow peeps when I'm giving this seminar to them. And yes, I do give a lot of this FRIPTA seminar just to my escrow uh, industry. The client may say that he is not a foreigner, but does his social security number start with a nine on the FRIPTA form? If it does, that is a good indication that it is a tax identification number and not a social security number. And that means that he is a foreigner. An ITIN that has not been used for the last three years can be deactivated by the IRS. The client has to submit a request to activate it again. Well, we are not the ITIN police, so we do not know if an ITIN that was given to us is valid. The client themselves should check it because, of course, we do not want to use it to send out their withholding money. And then the client finds out it was deactivated, and now he has to go through a whole process to try to get his money back. This is an important tip that I have here. The IRS code states that the buyer is the withholding agent. So they make the buyer responsible for the withholding and any penalties. After all, who can go, wh where can the IRS go to for unpaid tax debt if the seller has already left the country without filing his income taxes on his tax gain? So keep the buyer in the loop. He has to sign the withholding 8288 form before closing, and it's going to be his social security number or tax ID number that is on that form. Now, the withholding, I said, is based on the sales price, not on the profit, not on the gain that they are making on the property. Withholding is required even if the client has no gain or is selling at a loss. This also applies to a short sale transaction in which the sales price is less than what the seller owes and the seller walks away with no money. Well, before he walks away with no money, he has to come in with the withholding amount or he has to submit a reduced withholding amount. And then we have to wait before that letter comes back before the transaction can close. This is on a short sale. If the client is a, if the client seller is a couple, 
the IRS looks at them as two separate persons. Each has to have their own ITIN or social security number. If one of them does not, then they have to withhold on the one that is not, and it's usually at 50% of the sales price. If one is a foreigner and one is not, depending on how they file their income taxes on the property or or some, or if they did not file, how about you ask them to do a little advanced planning before they even list the property for sale? The couple should actually deed the property to the non-foreigner, so that withholding will be bypassed in the escrow when it opens. Again, you need to ask them to talk to their legal and financial counsel before taking the step. Now, the buyer is very much affected by this whole process, right? To sign a buyer's declaration, the buyer has to be an individual, cannot be a corporate entity, and he has to sign under penalty of perjury about using the property as his principal residence. So we asked the buyer to get his own legal counsel regarding signing this declaration under penalty of perjury. And of course, if he has any questions. If a buyer cannot sign this declaration, for instance, if this is a vacant land or a commercial property, this is going to be a big red flag and 15% of the sales price will then need to be withheld. Let me repeat again another tip I tell all my escrow peeps. Be sure the foreign seller always, get, always gives a U.S. address for the FIRPTA forms. And finally, I tell my escrow peeps that we need an amendment should all this amendment should always be done as a disclosure to all the parties of what will happen with FERPTA and the 593 withholdings and everybody's roles and responsibilities. Well, due to time limitations, I won't go into detail regarding the California withholding, but it, here it is in general. The California Franchise Tax Board 593 withholding certificate is to be given to every single seller who is selling a piece of property in California. The regulations don't care if you are a foreigner or not. But here's what you have to watch for. The basic withholding is 3.33% of the sales price. The most common exemption is the principal residence exemption. They have to live on it for two out of the last five years. And there are other exemptions that are listed that the seller can use. You check the list on the 593 form that the escrow officer sends out at the opening. It not only includes the exemption for the principal residence, but also for 1031 exchange and whether or not the seller is doing a seller carryback. The foreign seller states that this is his principal residence, but he does not have an I-10, then withholding must apply. The escrow officer has to withhold the full 3.33% of the sales price and mail it in by the 20th day of the month after the closing month. Like the IRS forms, the box for the item is also marked applied for for the tax ID number. And when the client does get the tax ID number, this is given to the FTB with an amended 593 form. Like the FERPTA, the withholding for the uh, the 593 requirements fall on the buyer, but the seller is responsible for completing the form correctly, and the escrow officer is in charge of giving out the disclosure of withholding, collecting the signed forms, and sending the amounts to the Franchise Tax Board within the time period provided. There are also penalties for delayed filings. I'm sorry, I was told 20 minutes to max, so I ran out of time. But if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to call me. My information is here. Jot it down. My phone number, my email address. And if you are interested on, in my other escrow educational seminar materials, my YouTube channel is called Think Escrow. And I have escrow tips and things like that that go up. Uh, periodically for you to look at and think about. Thank you. Awesome, Appreciate it. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, great information. Very comprehensive. Uh, we do have a few questions. I think we'll, uh, we'll cover just a couple of them. 
We have a question from Mr. Frederick Murga. Uh, what about the customer signature from foreign countries? What happens if, embassy, if the embassy or consulate is closed due to COVID considerations? Well, they can try doing the remote online notarization. Now, there's a couple of things that they have to worry about if they're doing a signature for a notarization and the American consulate is not open. The remote online notarization calls for a couple of things. First of all, the company has to be a reputable company that the title company will uh, agree to let them use. This company is going to to check on the client's knowledge-based authentication forms, meaning do your clients have any information in the US that they can Google and look and say, oh yes, this is the client. If they don't have uh, what we call KBA, the company will not do it. Secondly, we have to make sure that the title company accepts the notary from that company. And thirdly, that the county recorder's office will accept it. So if they cannot get notarization at the American consulate, I would highly recommend that you call your escrow officer and talk to them about it and see what other measures can be done. Fantastic. Um, one more question, uh, Juliana. Um, the two individual foreigner withholding, do they each hold 15 or 50% each to the withholding? 50, five zero. Five they zero. consider husband and wife each having 50. Fantastic, fantastic. So I think, um, again, you covered so much that I think, uh, <laughs> I imagine you'll stay on the call for a little longer. So should there be questions from our audience, if they could uh, uh, post them in the chat box uh, on direct, uh, you see the contact information for Ju Juliana on the screen. So please reach out to her. Uh, obviously, she's a wealth of, uh, of information. So Juliana, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Victoria K. Joe, Senior Counsel Gordon Reese Scully Mansukani, LLP. Victoria T. K. Joe is a Senior Counsel in the Los Angeles office of Gordon and Reese and is a member of the Construction Practice Group. Ms. Kejo has extensive experience with professional liability litigation, having defended lawyers, design professionals, and real estate professionals against claims from alleged negligent acts and omissions in the performance of their professional services. Ms. Kejo has broad experience in general civil litigation in matters involving real estate, wrongful foreclosures, labor and employment law, civil rights, fraud, personal injury, breach of contract, Law. Ms. Kejo has prepared multiple immigration petitions, including family-based adjustment of status petitions, consular processing, asylum petitions, U visas, battered spouse petitions, waivers, and work-based adjustment of status petitions, including H-1B and PERM applications. She's also handled immigration appeals before the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Ms. Kejo graduated from the J. Rubin Clark Law School at Brigham Young University with an LLM, Master's in Law in Comparative Law in 2008. She was admitted to the California Bar in 2009, the United States District Court, Central District of California in 2012, and the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in 2012. Please help me welcome Ms. Victoria K. Jo. Welcome. Thank you. I am honored today, or, uh, honored to be able to uh, attend this global summit, and I express my appreciation to the organizers for the opportunity to be able to talk about these very important topics. I'm talking about uh, immigration visas and the real estate industry. I believe that these are topics that are very important for real estate professionals who have clients who are foreign nationals and are trying to either immigrate to the United States or to purchase property in the United States. An overview of the things that I'll be talking about today are the EB-5 program, work visas, and then we're going to uh, very briefly revisit the Trump administration's uh, travel ban and talk about the current status of those bans and what impact, if any, it has on your foreign national um, clients who are trying to either purchase property in the United States or immigrate to the United States. Obviously, immigration law is very broad. Um, there's several aspects of it, different kinds of visas that we're not gonna be able to cover in this uh, 30 minutes that I've been assigned. But um, 
I would provide my um, contact information and I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, that come up after this presentation. So let's jump in. We're gonna start by talking about the EB-5 visa program. The first question that we always get is what is the EB-5? EB-5 program is a program that allows foreign nationals to get a green card or permanent residence for themselves, their spouses, and up to four children. Who are those that can um, get this EB-5? Any business investor who invests in a new commercial enterprise in the United States um, and meets the requirements is able to get an EB-5 visa. There are requirements, as I said, we're gonna talk about what those requirements are. Number one is whatever investment is done must provide employment for at least 10 US workers. There are also minimum investment amounts, which would we'll go into in a second, the different types of investments that qualify for this. And then we're gonna talk about targeted employment area designations. Talking about the investment amounts, the EB-5 program have been around for several years. Historically, it was $1 million or $500,000 if you were investing in what is called a targeted employment area or a TAE. Obviously, this is um, not a little bit of money. A million dollars is a lot of money. However, in 2019, the Trump administration passed what they called the EB-5 Immigrant Investor Program Modernization Final Rule. And what President Trump did at the time was to raise the minimum amount from 1 million to 1.8 million and from $500,000 to $900,000 if the investor was making the, the investment in a targeted employment area. These amounts made people very angry <laughs> and very sad because um, the, it almost doubled the um, investment amounts that were required. It pretty much shut the door to many foreign investors who were interested in coming to the United States to invest. And the second thing that this immigrant invest, investor program modernization final rule did was to say that UA, USCIS will now directly review and determine the designations of how unemployment TAEs I will no longer defer to the TAE designations made by the states and local governments. Let me explain that. Remember how I talked about $500,000 being the minimum amounts that were required if you were investing in a targeted employment area? Historically, the states were allowed to designate what that targeted employment area was. So for example, the state of California would tell you, okay, this is an area we think is rural. It needs people to um, get employment. So if you're investing in this area, you only need to invest $500,000. However, with this rule that Trump passed in 2019, this rule pretty much took that away from the states and put it in the hands of United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, USCIS. So regardless of what the states designated, USCIS was now in charge of designating what a TAE was. So they would tell you if they believe that that area was really a TAE or not. This new rule made several people very uncomfortable, sad, um, and several people complained and a lawsuit uh, followed. This lawsuit was brought by a company called Barron Regional Center LLC. They filed the lawsuit and basically challenged um, the rule that Trump had passed in November of 2019. The lawsuit has dragged on for several months, but thankfully on June 22nd, 2021, a judge issued a decision in the case of Barron Regional Center versus Wolf. And that decision pretty much vacated the EB-5 Immigrant Investor Program Modernization Final Rule. The judge held that the acting director of DHS, Department of Homeland Security at the time, was not formally acting in his role when he made these changes to the EB-5 program. With the decision on June 22nd, 2021, people were very happy, especially those who were trying to invest in the EB-5 program. 
However, there were some kinds of confusion. People were not sure what USCIS was going to do, how this rule was going to be applied. And so we were waiting for a formal response from USCIS. Just a couple of weeks ago, USCIS responded. And this um, quote on this slide is directly from the USCIS website. USCIS stated that while they consider this decision, they will continue to apply the EB-5 regulations that were in effect before the rule was finalized on November 21, 2019. What that means is pretty much USCIS is going to follow the judge's decision. And so the standard amounts that are now required for the EB-5 investment programs have reverted back to the original rule, which is a million dollars and $500,000 if you're investing in a TAE. The second thing that the USCIS stated in their response is that um, the state designations, the states will now be able to designate what a TAE is. So pretty much with the decision on June 22nd, the EB-5 program has reverted back to what it was before the rule in November of 2019. The next question that we get asked all the time regarding the EB-5 is what kinds of investments? What can I invest in? There are two answers to that question. You can invest in what is called a direct investment or you can invest in a regional center. A direct investment is when an investor either directly invests in a commercial enterprise by himself or with a partner or he starts a business or he buys a business. So when you, for example, an investor, a foreign national takes a million dollars, which is the minimum and buys a 20% share in a business that is valued at 5 million, that would qualify as a direct investment. What is a regional center? According to the USCIS, an EB-5 regional center is an economic or public or private um, in the United States that involved with promoting economical growth. What that means is there are certain companies that basically gather investments from several investors and they invest in different commercial enterprises throughout the United States. So the original centers could invest in real estate, sometimes they build houses, sometimes they build hospitals, sometimes they build schools and a large percentage of the investors who invest and are interested in the EB-5 program actually use the regional center investments. This is because it makes it easy. You don't have to worry about employing the 10 US citizens that um, the EB-5 program requires because the regional centers pretty much do that for you. They keep your money in escrow, in a trust, and the money is pulled from all the different investors and they manage it and let you and your attorneys know exactly what's happening with your money. So as high as I would say probably 95% of those who work with the, with the EB-5 programs go through regional centers. And we have several regional centers that we work with. Um, obviously would let you know what it is that they're working on, what the investment projects are, and uh, make sure that you're comfortable with that um, before you proceed. Now, the issue is following the decision, um, the decision uh, on June 22nd only affected the direct investments. The regional centers are governed by statutory authority. With regards to the regional centers, unfortunately on June 30th, 2021, the statutory authorization for the regional center program expired. Congress did not extend it. They still have not extended it. So basically no applications for those who are interested in the EB-5 program using the regional center is being accepted by CIS right now. All those who were approved using the regional center investments, their application is not being currently pro processed until Congress directs USCIS as to what exactly they want to do with this regional center program. So what this means is right now, as we're speaking and starting from July 1, 2021, 
any investments in the EB-5 program would have to be through direct investments, either through the $1 million or for the $500,000 for a targeted employment area. USCIS, however, stated that they would continue to provide further guidance to the public depending on how the circumstances change. But for now, all regional center EB-5 investment programs have pretty much been suspended until, CI, uh, until Congress extends uh, congressional approval for that. Now, what's, what are the impacts of USCIS's response and the decision in Barry? EB-5 applications based on direct investments will continue to be processed. However, EB-5 applications based on regional centers are not being accepted. However, and very important for you and your foreign national clients, the decision in the Bering case was made pretty much on a technicality and no injunction was, was put in place. The judge said that USCIS and the Department of Homeland Security had pretty much made a mistake. Um, the acting director did not have the authority to pass that rule and he did not enjoin them or stop them from correcting the mistake that they made. So it's very possible that the Department of Homeland Security could again raise the minimum amounts that are required for the EB-5 program. The second thing is that this decision could be appealed. USCIS has responded and basically said, you know, we're going to agree with what you said, but it's possible that the Department of Homeland Security could appeal this decision. What that means is right now, there's a very limited window. We don't know how long the investments amounts are going to stay at $1 million and $500,000. So those of your clients who are interested in the EB-5 program, now would be the time to act. I wanted to touch briefly on the EB-5 timeline process. This is a process that would take anywhere between 18 to 24 months. So to start for the direct investment program, the investor would have to meet with the attorney, documents are collected, um, documents are filed, and then after about 20 months, USCIS would approve the petition, and then the investor would file the form I-829, which is the application to remove conditions, because once the application is initially granted, which is somewhere between the two-year mark, um, then they're given conditional resident status. What this means is that they're given a conditional green card. It's not a permanent one. It could expire. And then after 24 months, um, or depending on what the backlog is, the investor could apply to have those conditions removed. And then after five years, the investor could apply to become a US citizen. So this is a wonderful mechanism that could allow a foreigner or a foreign professional um, who has the money to invest in the EB-5 program to become a US citizen eventually. Talking about the benefits of the EB-5 program, it allows you to acquire real estate. It provides a green card for the investor and their qualifying family member. And like I just said, it provides for eventual citizenship. However, and I think it's very important, the primary aim of the EB-5 program is to provide a path to to permanent residence and eventual citizenship. It is not to provide a huge return on investment. Because a lot of people say, okay, I'm investing a million dollars. Is there any guarantee that I'm going to make X amount of money after I invest this money? Unfortunately, the answer to that is no. It is an investment like every other investment. The return is negligible, if any, and the primary aim is to provide permanent residency and eventual citizenship. Now I will move a little bit from the EB-5 program and talk about other work visas. For those of you who have foreign nationals who cannot afford either $500,000 or a million dollars to invest, there's several other work visas that your clients can qualify for. There are some temporary non-immigrant visas and there's some permanent immigrant visas. The temporary visas are the ones that allow for your clients to come to the United States, live and work in the United States for a certain amount of time. But as the name states, these are temporary visas and after the expiration of the term, 
your client would need to go back to their country. However, um, some temporary uh, non-immigrant visas allow for a path to permanence. So we're happy to talk about that and time will not allow me to go through that. Examples of the temporary non-immigrant visas are the E visas, the H visas, L visas, O visas. And I know these are uh, alphabets that probably mean nothing, but we're happy to elaborate on that. And then there are permanent immigrant visas. A permanent worker is a foreign national who comes into the United States and is granted a visa which allows and authorizes them to live and work permanently in the United States. There are different preferences, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth pre preference. And the EB-5 visa is actually the, uh, in the category of the fifth preference. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about um, immigration status and the purchase of real estate. While dealing with um, foreign nationals who want to purchase real estate in in the United States. It, I believe it's important for um, the real estate professional to know what your client's um, immigration uh, status is. This is because you know, some people purchase properties all cash and some people would need loans. With regards to all cash purchases, there is no law that says a foreign national cannot buy property. So if people have all cash, that's totally fine. You know, their immigration status is of no consequence. But when we're talking about um, a mortgage and acquiring loans, it becomes important to know what a person's immigration status is. This is because those who are undocumented might have a more difficult time. Thankfully, there's a lot of banks now that would offer a mortgage to un an, an undocumented pe person. I know that uh, the Ventile Financial Group is one of them. Earlier today, we heard from Loan Direct. They also offer these programs. Um, I know that Citibank also offers certain uh, mortgages to, um, uh, to, um, to, to these um, undocumented immigrants. So it's, it's important that you know what your client's uh, uh, immigration status is so you can better guide them with regards to the purchase of real estate. We have had cases where you know, fraudulent act activities took place. We've had cases where you know, someone comes to you, they're undocumented, they don't have um, a social security number or an ITIN, and so they want another person to buy this property in their name for them. So it's like person A is the true buyer, but he's buying it through person B. So a situation like that is fraudulent and um, the real estate professional should not engage in this kind of behavior. Um, there are several cases that we've had uh, concerning fraud and, um, you know, this is discovered, there's a lawsuit all around, and then the real estate professional gets, you know, sued because, you know, uh, they have either unknowingly participated in some kind of fraud. We're happy to talk to you about risk management, but again, this is why it's important to know what your client's immigration status is so you can properly guide them. Talking about fraud, just very briefly, uh, there are very, various cases. I wanted to highlight the case of Fleet versus Bank of America, where the court held that a real estate agent or an agent and employee is always liable for his or her own torts. And so when you participate with your client in the commission of any kind of fraud, you would be held liable. Or worse, you know, your broker could also be sued too. So it's very important that you don't uh, get yourself roped in this kind of behavior. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, President Trump's uh, travel bans. This was important because um, starting on September 24th and going all through the beginning of this year, um, previous President, uh, President Trump had announced through presidential proclamations that certain Muslim countries, um, the citizens of those countries could not legally immigrate because they were banned. Um, the first travel ban affected countries like Iran, Libya, North Korea, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. Even though the bans allowed for a waiver, those waivers were extremely difficult to get. On January 31st, 2020, President Trump extended his travel ban to affect also countries like 
uh, Burma, Eritrea, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, Sudan, and Tanzania. All like travel ban three, travel ban four, Point o only affected immigrant visas. So temporary workers could still come to the United States. What, it, what is the effect of these travel bans, if any? Basically, what those did was to make it impossible for your foreign nationals from these affected countries to be able to have their visa applications approved. So if you had an investor, for example, who was interested in an EB-5 program, it would be not, it, it wouldn't make any sense to apply because unless they could get a waiver granted, their visas would be denied at the end of the day because they were banned just based on the countries from which uh, they came. However, the current status of the travel ban, on January 20, 2021, President Joe Biden signed an order that revoked all of the travel bans. And this is a side it, this is cause for rejoicing and for a good sigh of relief because no country is currently subject to a travel ban. So it doesn't matter where your client is from, as long as they meet the qualifications to have their visas approved, their applications will be approved. They're not subject to any travel bans currently. I am so grateful for the time I've had to be able to share with you just very briefly on immigration visas and the real estate industry. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. K. Jo. Uh, we do have. Uh, obviously, you covered a whole bunch, <laughs> but let me let me let me see. I have a, a couple questions. Uh, our first question: Can the five hundred thousand or a million be used to purchase a commercial building to build a business of ten employees? Correct. Yes. Um, one of the questions we get is: What if I buy a house that's worth a million dollars? Obviously, a primary residence where you and your family would leave would not provide employment for 10 US, employee, uh, US citizens. So that would not qualify. But yes, a commercial building, you would have to obviously fill out a bunch of paperwork, show what the business is, the employment that it's going to provide, and all of that. And that's what your lawyer guides you through. So we're happy to help you. But yes, that's a possibility. Now, with MSK Joe, with regards to, you talked about um, the, the risk management, but generally speaking, best practices for real estate professionals, both, you know, lenders and realtors alike, um, what, um, can they reach out to you uh, for your services and, uh, and get that type of guidance or even, even uh, you know, again, just guidelines that they can continue to follow, such as what you've uh, pr provided on the, on the slides today? Yes, my contact information is down there. That is my cell phone number. It comes directly to me. Oh, we gotcha. are happy to answer questions every any time. You can text, email, call me. Um, we we one of the services we also provide is we go into brokerages and we educate uh, real estate professionals as wow. to um, you know certain pitfalls that they should try to avoid. So yes, I'm very happy to talk to you. I have uh, defended a lot of uh, real estate agents from, um, you know, uh, lawsuits alleging negligence on their errors and omissions. So yes, we're we're very um, experienced in this area and happy to provide the service. Clearly, yeah, your your credentials speak for themselves, and and clearly the information you provided. I do have a follow up to the first question. Um, do all the ten employees have to be U.S. citizens? Yes, they do. Okay, they okay, do. so that. That is an important topic. So wonderful, uh, Ms. K. Joe. I really, really appreciate you taking uh, your time you have, you know, being so generous with it. I'm sure you're plenty busy, but obviously we, we are big uh, proponents of, of, of uh, having the information to empower us all. And, and obviously the global market is an important market. So we, we thank you so, so much for, uh, for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. And please let me know if there's any other way I can help. Fantastic. Thank you again, Ms. K. Jill. Have a nice one. Um, perfect. So once again, we'd like to thank both of our speakers, Ms. Juliana Tu and uh, Ms. Victoria K. Jill for this great panel they've provided us. Uh, this concludes our Q&A session of the escrow and latest updates on immigration visa segment. We really appreciate our speakers for their presentations and for answering all of our questions. A big thank you also uh, to our sponsors as well, and we'll make their information available 
it's important again we support them and uh they've been very kind to support us so um now i'd like to give the floor to tom sang who will be introducing our next panelist who will be speaking about the global investment trends in several several countries uh, tom please take it away thank you mauricio my name is tom Zeng. i'm the 2021 vice chair of global business council in the next session i'll be introducing the next speakers they represent our NAR global coordinators from most part of the world. Our first speaker is Mark Kitabayashi. Mark has been a realtor for 21 years in Washington state and is involved in many aspects of real estate, including association leadership, local jurisdiction, and global instructor presenter. His primary business are residential, new construction, foreclosure, and global investment. His NAR designations include Certified uh, Investment Property Manager, Certified Residential Specialist, Accredited Buyer Representative, At Home with Diversity, uh, Resort and Second Home Property Specialist, Pricing Strategy Advisor, Short Sale and Foreclosure Resources, Senior Special Real Estate uh, Specialist, as well as ASP, CSP, C2EX, EPRO, Green NRP, and much more. Mark has been president of Thurston Con County Realtors since 2006 and again in 2010. He is currently for our 2021 NAR Global Coordinator for Asia Pacific Region. He also hosted CRS Content Workshop Seminar Provider for national and global level. Our NAR National Global and Instructor for Code of Ethics, Certified in Special Property Specialist, At Home with Diversity and ABR, et cetera. Now, without further ado, let's welcome our guest speaker, Mark Kitabayashi, for his presentation on Asia Pacific market. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. I know that uh, today uh, we have a three out of the five uh, regional coordinators for NAR. So I will start. So let me go through with what our region is. As you know, this, I mean, we have a very limited time but we'll go through it fairly quickly. Now that you learn all the technical details about the investor, and I'm gonna look at it in a couple of different phases. So first one will be just the facts about our region. My region is Asia Pacific, that's including from a, I guess the East from Japan, Korea side to all the way to uh, India and to below, uh, below means Southern hemisphere to New Zealand, Australia. So facts about our region, one thing is we have over 50% of the world population. Worldwide is 7.88 billion, the US just for information is about 330 million. And we have the, of course, China and India who's are over billion. And a lot of people didn't know that Indonesia is a lot, Indonesia, Pakistan is a very large country. Even uh, Bangladesh is a large country. Japan has 128 million. And also when you, from the World Bank statistics, ease of doing business, we have the top three, actually top uh, five, uh, four out of five, uh, New Zealand being one of them, Singapore being one of them, number three is Hong Kong, and number five is South Korea. And just for information, Denmark is now number four, and uh, US is number six. This is per World Bank. And there's very detail-oriented why they consider us ease of business. Uh, you, could, you could look it up on the World Bank side as well. And as most of you know, and I think most of you are familiar as well, it is still the fastest grow, uh, econ economic growth. Asia to stay world's the fastest growing region through 2030. Uh, this is from many newspapers from Depot by New York Times and everything else. And one of the thing is within the region, we are one of the most variety of languages and a culture with very different cultures within a one region as well. And I'm sure you learned this if you have taken a CIPS class, you have learned that as well. But if you have not taken CIPS class, I highly recommend you to take a CIPS class uh, that NAR offer, even if you're only doing an in inbound uh, to uh, LA, uh, LA and Southern California area. So a couple of fun facts about our region. Number one, Three consecutive Olympics in our region. We have the Pyeongchang, uh, which is the Winter uh, Winter Olympics in Korea 2018. Of course, Tokyo 2020, 21, however you want to call it. It's happening right now and for the last few days. And we have the Beijing Olympic coming up in 2022, which is uh, which is uh, which is in in China. 
And uh, most of you know, uh, LA is hosting 2024. Last time LA first hosted was, I think, uh, I believe it, it was the 1984 Olympics. And I happened to be living in LA at that time. Um, uh, I was uh, grown in grown South, Southern California. I even lived in the San Gabriel area as well for a lot of you uh, that's from that association. And a couple other things. Indonesia is the largest Islam Muslim country in the world. Some people feel that some parts of the Middle East are the largest. Actually, the number one is uh, Indonesia, and number two is Pakistan, 227 million out of 276 population, Pakistan 204 out of 225. And other fun facts, we have the world's longest commercial flight. Commercial means the, uh, the flights that we take, nonstop flight. JF JFK to Singapore is 18 hours and 40 minutes. LA to Singapore um, is 17 hours and 50 minutes. And, and just for a comparison, I like the JFK is about uh, five hours, 11 minutes, or about 2,400 square, uh, 20, 2,400 miles. So these are some fun facts about our region. So let's look at it, see how did coronavirus affect our region? Number one, 2022, we fared we fare very, very well as a region. Uh, low, very low infection rate, and some of the country didn't even have any death or very minimal single-digit death in 2020, or at least early part of the coronavirus. But you know, we have a fourth or fifth or however wave that we call it. Uh, 2021, we have a very high infection rate on uh, a fourth or fifth wave, or whatever you want to call it, as well. But we have some country like uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia as well. They they are uh, still doing very well compared to a lot of the other countries. But as you know, like India has increased tremendously with the Delta um, Delta variants. And also things like me. So you know, as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned, please check with the, whatever the country you're interested in. And because of that, uh, another issue is well, many of our countries in the Asian Pacific are very slow on the vaccination. That's including Japan as well, very low rate. And they're not, they're not even at 20% a lot of the countries are so getting there very close. But those are one concern that we have. And of course, with the many travel restrictions and rules, uh, a lot of the quarantines and so forth are concerned of going, in, going back and forth between two, uh, whatever the country it is. And also, this is hit, hitting very hard on lower income population as well in a lot of the, because a lot of the Asian countries still are considered as a developing country. So uh, they're, they're hitting the low incomes are hot, hit very hard. So let's, let's look at real estate trade uh, trend as well. Cross border capital flow still slow in 2021 because of the COVID, a lot of the restriction. But in 2020, Japan, Korea, Singapore had a significant activity because those are the large, especially in the large commercial investment, because there was a low COVID infection rate and a lot of the uh, global investor, their job is to invest in the real estate and they have to invest. They couldn't stop during the COVID. So when they looked at it, they said, what cities are very safe compared to uh, COVID in 2020? They found that Japan, Korea, Singapore's large city like Tokyo, Seoul, or Singapore has been very fair, very well compared to some of the large city metropolitan area that we know of, like uh, London, New York, and Paris. Those, you know, uh, those cities are hit very hard as well. And even within the COVID 2020, China is seeing significant inbound activity, still a lot of the opportunity in China. And still our gateway, uh, gateway cities are very active, regional gateway cities are active, I mentioned like Japan, Singapore, and Tokyo, Singapore, and even Hong Kong and so forth. But there are some areas that political uncertainty is affecting the inbound business as well. And whether it's a very large issue like we have in Myanmar uh, with a type of coup d'etat or the internal uh, conflict or some of the uh, political uh, ideologies or the, the leadership that they have uh, within, uh, within the countries, that, that could be, uh, be some concern for everyone. But you know, a lot of them, why it is happening is continue to be after probably with the COVID as well and retirement destination. And a lot of the country has a special retirement visa for foreigners to, with a certain country, very low cost of living and, and they have a special visa program as well. And of course, a lot of the second home market is uh, growing within the Asia region. Now the, a lot of the remote 
uh, remote uh, working is becoming a norm to some of the industry, that they could work not just outside of their uh, office, but outside of their country as well. And Asia is the same as well. So let's look at it and the real estate in uh, trend US inbound. This is just almost overall, but lowest since 2011. This uh, this report came, uh, NAR's report just came up, came back, came up, up like actually early this uh, this year, uh, this, uh, this month of the newest one. 2011, 1.8% of the existing home sales were the foreign buyers. This is a volume, but highest uh, 2012 was 5.2%. COVID-19 19 travel restriction restricted a lot of the individual investor who would like to see the property, but they will buy it. Of course, uh, that slowed down in the individual vo uh, volume. And of course, our lack of inventory in the United States has slowed down the investment coming in as well. Top in five inbound volume is coming still coming from China, Canada, Mexico, India, and UK. So two of the top three or uh, five countries in Asia as well. And top five U.S. destination is Florida, California, Texas, Arizona, New Jersey, New York. And China still is the number one in volume, but falls to number three in unit purchases. So meaning that Chinese people are still buying a lot of the expensive property. So I know that China is one of the largest investors in the United States. So I want to look at a little bit about the China what they're doing right now. These are real estate uh, trends from China. This information was provided by the juai.com, which is the largest uh, real estate uh, uh, website, uh, business to consumer website in China. So from there, they, they saw the top inquiries are Thailand, US, Australia, Canada, and UK. And top US cities were Los Angeles, Seattle, Orlando, Houston, New York, San Francisco, Irvine, California, Dallas, Boston, San Jose, et cetera. And they're looking at it as a, we're looking at the potential as a Chinese investor. Number one is by 2025, there will most likely be 6 million high net worth Chinese. And basically high net worth Chinese are not just the one million, millionaires and all, but it's a lot higher than that as well. But they're on the four or five uh, multiple properties in uh, overseas already. In 2025, 720 million people will be considered as a middle class. That's a larger than most of the country when you consider that uh, U.S.'s population is about 330. There's two times more of U.S. population is going to be middle class and potentially becoming an investor as well. In 2022, and 57 million is going to be affluent uh, Chinese, meaning that they are able to own they own a property, one to two properties outside outside of the United States. So China is to be looked at. And as we look at in many different countries in the Asia, the inbound activities hopefully will pick up uh, starting 2022 when the COVID items are uh, better. And I hear from, the, uh, you know, when you look at like a convention coming to US, a lot of our foreign investors from Asia say, you know what, I'm, I'd love to go to US, but if when I come back, there's a strict quarantine regulation in many of a country from 14 to 10 days to whatever it might be. So they say, you know, I can't be in a, under strict quarantine when I come back. So I'm still going to pause the show. And I want to share a little bit about a glo uh, NER's global in Asia Pacific. So what does that mean? So these are some of the countries with a bilateral agreement that we have already. We have an NAR's agreement, we have it. I know the uh, many of the local association has a bilateral agreement as well. And then the princesses are the, uh, the um, association in that country that we have a bilateral agreement. Some of the country has one association, some, some country has a multiple association and we have agreement with a multiple uh, association as well. And as far as NER Global Pacific is concerned, IRM are international realtor members. These are the, some of the members who are considered as a, a part of the 1.5 million realtor family. And these are the international uh, realtors uh, from the, some of the countries. Japan being the our largest in the Asia portion. And of course, then we've got Mongolia, Philippines, and there are other countries that's in the larger. And slash on the backside of it is how many members of actually currently active CIPS member that's there. So please, uh, if you're looking to reach out to these places, uh, you are able to use a network that NAR has as well. So a more clear, uh, closer uh, things. Uh, we have a global ambassador for 
Uh, we have a five of us that's who's in the area as well. If it's not global ambassadors that are listed there, that means we don't currently don't have a global ambassador. Feel free to reach out to these individuals, uh, Linda Lee, uh, Hiroko Nishika, Nauma, both of them are from the Southern California area, I mean, including San Diego, sorry. And also we have a two from, uh, actually three from Chicago area, Pradeep and Nancy and Vicky uh, are from the Chicago area as well. And we do have a, other areas, if you have a, a concern or question, please feel free to contact me as well. And finally, a NAR assigns by request of a local or state association has been assigned as an ambassador association to some of the Asian countries. And these are the ambassadors to the Asian countries, including your, uh, uh, your association, West San Gabriel Association. Uh, uh, Gabriel uh, Associate Realtor is uh, official ambassador association in Taiwan as well. And I know that West San Gabriel has a many bilateral agreement MOU with the many of the associations and country as well. So there are some uh, area that's open. If you belong to uh, an association that's not part of this, that might be some of the consideration that you might want to uh, have as a far as ambassador association is concerned. So I kind of quickly run through the Asia Pacific any question, and this is my uh, uh, contact information, uh, mark at windermere.com, or you feel free to find me through our website as well. So that concludes my presentation part. Any questions? Mark, very much. Um, I do not see any sure. question at the moment. And there are many feedbacks and thing, thank you for the presentation. It was not very a problem. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop share and pass it on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is David McCoy, our NAR Global Coordinator for North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. David has been licensed realtor specializing in commercial real estate in Kentucky and Indiana since 2001. David focuses on consulting and marketing for commercial and international buyers sellers and investors. He has been active with NAR Global since 2013. He holds a certified international property specialist at home with diversity, EPRO, and real estate negotiation expert, negotiation expert designations with the National Association of Realtors. David has spoken at real estate conferences in Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, and in the USA. David has been an active member of his local real estate association since 2001. He has an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin and a BS program, uh, a BS <laughs> Bachelor of Science from Vanderbilt University. In addition to NAR Global, David has done volunteer work with the National Immigrant, Immigrant Justice Center, Waterstep, the University at the United Way, and the University of Texas. Let's give a warm welcome to our NAR Global Coordinator, David McCoy, for his presentation on North, Central America, and the Caribbean. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, I didn't bring any slides. I decided I would just kind of talk about cer certain topics. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I think that uh, the timing of this was lucky. Uh, we had, um, which, it's also very hard to follow Mark. Uh, Mark is always super organized and, it, and he's super smart. And so I always feel like he's a little bit up here. I have, I have to shoot high to try to follow Mark. But uh, just to kind of, um, we were lucky in that um, NER produces, I think many of you all are aware of this, but NER does an annual uh, international real estate investment in the U.S. for residential uh, real estate. They do a report on that every year. That has been released within the last couple of weeks. Um, following that, uh, within the last week or so, NAR sponsored a uh, global uh, real estate forecast summit. Um, many of y'all may have participated in that. We had about 2,000 people participate. Uh, and uh, so that uh, we had uh, um, Lawrence Yoon, uh, the chief economist of uh, NAR uh, presented. We also had George Schmiel, who is, um, he, I, he, I'm not sure if he's CEO, but he is with uh, Zhuai. Uh, we had uh, um, the uh, Canadian Real Estate Association, Sean uh, Cathcart. 
and we had someone from Australia, uh, Narita Conisby, who presented. So all this information is is new. Uh, so it's pretty up to date. And um, I am going to be borrowing some facts from them. Uh, I, as I said, I don't have slides. If we want to, I can give you the link when we're done here in the chat. Uh, that has the recording of that summit, and it also has all the slides um, that they used. So um, uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, as I said, uh, I am the global coordinator for North America, uh, the Caribbean, and um, Central America. Uh, I've been working with NAR for about uh, eight years now. Um, I have in my region, I think we have 14 countries right now. Uh, and uh, so we have a diverse group of people. I have three great uh, global ambassadors that work with me um, in this area. So uh, I am luckier than Mark in that we basically only have two languages. We only have to, to English and Spanish. Um, there are a few other languages in there, but if you know English and Spanish, you can pretty much do uh, pretty well. Um, so uh, let's. Uh, so kind of what I have in mind here is um, uh, I'm going to kind of kind of giving you a little bit of a roadmap. I'm going to just kind of briefly touch because it can you know we will run out of time. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the global situation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. I'm going to talk a little bit about my region, uh, and um, we'll just kind of follow that path so to, to kind of help you follow along and of course uh, hopefully uh, I expect to have time for questions if there are any uh, when we're um, done so uh, let's let's uh, jump right into it so from a global perspective and uh, some of this stuff you all I know it's sort of obvious but we're going to just kind of mention it anyway the the big event of course for 2020 was the COVID um, and I would say that the big event for 2021 and 2022 is the vaccine. Um, it is, we are beginning to have a recovery worldwide. In 2020, there were very few countries, there were only a handful of countries that had a positive um, net economic growth by the end of the year. Uh, we're seeing that begin to expand uh, this year. Um, we, the U.S. inventory, as we all know, was at a historic lows, price increases of 23.4% across average across the country. I mean, it, it's just crazy. But we weren't the only ones who did that. In Canada, their prices also increased by nearly 25%. Uh, in Australia, it was over 15%. So this was a global phenomenon. Um, and although it was a global phenomenon, that's not to say that this occurred everywhere, because um, I think especially in uh, Canada and Australia, the U.S. and some of these areas, we had been having a shortage of um, new homes built for some time. And I think that it just kind of caught up with us at this time. But there are countries that did not benefit from that. Uh, there were some general trends that we're seeing again all over the world. Um, a lot more uh, people kind of leaving the very dense um, metropolitan areas and moving out into uh, more rural areas. Uh, Canada saw that, the U.S. saw that, Australia saw that. So that was kind of a worldwide um, trend. Um, so in the, uh, um, when we had the, the and, and the thing to remember about this is that was all, in, especially in the U.S., well, everywhere, this was all due to domestic demand. It was not due to international demand because in March of 2020, as we all know, the world basically shut down and all tourism almost almost entirely went away for the rest of 2020. And of course, with that, uh, international purchases also declined, which makes sense because, you know, if, if you're not there, uh, it just makes it 
um, you're more reluctant to buy if you can't go, and it's also harder to buy if you can't go. Uh, some of our panelists earlier today were talking about restrictions where you have to do certain things in person or you have to do things going on, and, and that just was not possible. So um, that uh, we had uh, foreign investment basically drop to zero. So uh, I'm going to move on a little bit here, just some of the stuff with the U.S., um, uh, again, I, you know, you all, uh, most of you all, I think are residential guys. So these are things you already know. 2020 was the best domestic residential market in 13 years. Prices increased 23.4% across the country. And again, this was all domestic demand. Um, 2021 foreign investment. Now that we are moving past and, and the COVID and we have the vaccine and some places are beginning to open up, you know, um, we have seen a $54 billion investment from foreign nationals in the United States. Um, so 2020, I think we just kind of throw that out. You know, I, I don't even know what the numbers are in 2020, but 54 point you know, billion is that's still only a third of where we were in 2017. We peaked in 2017 at about 150 billion. And in 2018 and 2019, those were also declining. Um, a lot of that, I would say, not entirely, but it was due to uh, China uh, moving back from investing in the US. Uh, you will recall we were having um, trade issues with Japan, I mean, with China at the time. And on top of that, China was also instituting more restrictions on currency. So we had a, a drop in interest. Uh, one thing I'm going to uh, go back to Mark's presentation. We expect, and, and I'll, I'll mention this again at the end, we expect the Chinese buyers to come back this year. Uh, the, for the first time in a few years in terms of uh, their interest in purchasing in the U.S., the U.S. is now uh, ranked back up at number two in terms of their preferences. Um, so while we're going through this a little bit more, we'll talk a little bit about the largest foreign buyers. Some of this stuff, uh, I think Mark may have covered a little bit, but I think it um, bears repeating. The largest foreign buyers in the U.S. right now, number one is Canada. Canada, and this is by number of units. Canada um, is the biggest uh, purchaser in the U.S. at this time. Number two is Mexico. Uh, number three is China. Uh, number four is India. And number five is um, the U.K., uh, all of those were down a little bit from the previous uh, year, except for the UK. The UK actually increased a little bit. Um, and where they're buying, 21%, uh, the largest single place is in Florida. But uh, the second place, uh, you know, lucky for you guys, is California. So 16% uh, of the foreign nationals purchase in California. Uh, number three is Texas, number four is Arizona, and uh, number five and six, it's a tie, is New Jersey and New York. Um, so we kind of see, you know, what are those buying patterns like? Uh, Florida, a lot of that is people looking for um, warm climates. Uh, there's a lot of Germans who go there. There's a lot from the UK. There's people from uh, Canada who go there. There's also a lot of people who are immigrating from um, South America. Uh, the, a few years, for a number of years, we had a lot of Brazilians coming in. Uh, we had a lot of Venezuelans coming in. Um, obviously, there's a big Cuban population in uh, Florida, so um, Florida gets those groups. Um, California uh, has um, a lot of uh, um, investment from Asia. Um, that would be um, primarily from China, Japan, and South Korea, but pretty much from all over Asia. Uh, I would say that probably most of the Asian investment occurs um, in California. Uh, that's not to neglect Mexico, uh, Mexico also uh, being uh, a border state there of California, invest in California, um, although Mexico's biggest investment is probably going to be in Texas. Um, 
Uh, Texas, again, gets the Mexican uh, investment. Texas also gets a lot of investment from tech companies, uh, tech companies that come and their employees. So um, we get that. Arizona, again, probably largely a lifestyle thing. A lot of Canadians going there. And New York and New Jersey, it's pretty much people attracted to the commercial centers um, trying to work in those areas. Um, right now, uh, about uh, in terms of people in the US and where they are looking, um, currently about 8% of the population of the US says that they might be interested in purchasing abroad. Their main areas of interest, number one is Mexico. Uh, number two is Canada. Number three is China. Uh, four is Costa Rica. Uh, five is Dominican Republic. Uh, six is Spain and seven is Argentina. So in my region, that means that, you know, Mexico, Costa Rica and, and Dominican Republic are, are all in my region. Um, so a little bit more about uh, my region. I have around 14 countries. Uh, the biggest single country, of course, is Mexico. Mexico has a population of about 125 million. I think it's a little bit higher than that. Uh, and uh, so Central America, the way that they have been affected, um, Central America was hit pretty hard. Uh, the, so a lot of those countries, many of the countries in my region depend very heavily on tourism. And of course, the tourism, you know, all but stopped uh, pretty much uh, everywhere. Mexico did better than a lot of Central America for a few reasons. One is just simply, it's a much bigger country, a much larger population. Uh, they didn't close down the whole time. Uh, because of that, they were able to have some people coming in. Uh, they also were able to um, sell uh, some houses to U.S. investors, uh, especially in resort areas or um, kind of luxury homes. Uh, but it was sort of a mixed bag with Mexico. Um, the rest of Central America was hit pretty hard. Uh, as they open back up, they're doing better. Um, the Caribbean region, um, it did, it did a little bit better, really. And part of that is because they began to adapt pretty quickly. Um, they, initially, they shut down, but a number of the countries instituted sort of restricted travel uh, people. And it was kind of funny. It was almost like they had a dual economy in a way in that um, people could come and they could go to the resorts, but they weren't really allowed to just kind of freely roam around. Uh, that's not to say they couldn't take tours and stuff, but they, it was very regulated. They had to be in certain areas and they were, you know, they couldn't really get uh, to certain areas. And, and so, but, uh, but because of that, they were able to continue getting some um, tourism business in their countries. Uh, the other thing that a number of them did is they instituted um, new visas uh, that the, for people to come in. Um, some of that was kind of oriented toward um, uh, digital nomads, so that people who maybe, you know, didn't want to, you know, sit at home, they, they might buy a home or lease a home in uh, the Caribbean, and they could stay there for an extended period of time and, and work um, from there. Uh, right now, just kind of giving you a... Uh, little bit of a flavor, you know, Dominican Republic is actually doing very well. Um, Mexico's doing much better. Uh, Costa Rica is open again and Belize is open again. Uh, that's, things are kind of um, tentative in all these countries in that uh, they're open right now, but they could shut down again. Uh, so, but the places that have been more open have been doing much better. Uh, Bahamas is improving, Jamaica is improving. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of where they are. So um, they asked me in preparing for this to kind of give you an idea about uh, investment in the US. So um, the, in the presentation that we had the other day, uh, George Schmiel gave us the reasons that were primarily Chinese reasons. And I would say that those 
are pretty universal. Uh, the, the four main reasons I think that people come to invest in the US, number one reason is generally education. Um, we have people all over in people in the Caribbean, uh, people who are more affluent, they are more likely to send their kids to college in the US. And so they often prefer to buy them a home and let them live in that home while they are there. Um, the second reason is investment. You know, the, the U.S. is still considered one of the safest areas in the world to put money and invest in money. And so people uh, come to the U.S. looking for ways that they can invest. Um, number three is probably lifestyle, uh, which, you know, kind of getting back to our Canadian friends and I mean, and the Germans and the people in the UK, I mean, their winters are cold. They are super, super cold. <laughs> so they just, they just need to, they need to come someplace and warm up for a little while. Um, and uh, probably the, um, the last thing is immigration, people who ultimately want to immigrate to the U.S. So those are probably the main things. So how that plays out with my region, uh, obviously the single largest group there, just because of its size, is going to be Mexico. Uh, as I mentioned, Mexico has about 125 plus million people. It's, um, I don't know if it's second or third largest economy in the Western Hemisphere right now. The uh, one, two, and three are U.S., uh, Brazil, and Mexico, and Mexico may be above Brazil right now. So um, I don't know, you know, not, I don't know, uh, in California, you all maybe, you know, you're close enough to California, I mean, to Mexico that you probably uh, are aware of this, but a lot of people, I think, in the U.S. don't understand that um, Mexico is not just a small economy. It's not a. It's not really a third world country, um, and there are a number of very wealthy Mexicans. Uh, most Mexicans invest in the U in uh, Texas, but they also go other areas. They go to, to California. Um, they go to Colorado. Um, that, that's kind of a. I think Colorado was number two or three in terms of where they went. And they, they, it's another lifestyle thing. They, they like uh, investing in like um, wealthy Mexicans in ski properties. Uh, so, um, you know, that's, that's one thing that uh, um, makes a lot of sense. So um, anyway, uh, one of the things they uh, asked about, you know, um, they asked me to talk about was what kind of barriers are there to investment for you all to kind of know that? And it just so happens that NAR asked that question um, to, to our uh, uh, people who potentially invest and then don't. And so we have a list and I'm going to look at my notes here. The single largest reason people do not, you know, investors who come to the U.S. do not buy here is they cannot find a property. It's lack of inventory. They're looking and they have not found what they were able to do. Um, the second reason given is the cost of the properties. Um, and I, I'm just, I, I kind of hate to do this, but I'm just going to kind of read through the list and then we'll make some comments. Um, financing is listed number three. Uh, immigration laws, um, property taxes, uh, they can't move their money. Um, condo or maintenance fees, uh, insurance costs, uh, U.S. tax laws, uh, exchange rates, and loss of home country benefits. Now, uh, this is available on some of those slides from the global um, summit that we did uh, with NAR last week. Um, but I guess what I want you to do is just kind of think about that. I mean, some of the people... Um, I don't know how many of y'all have had the pleasure of meeting uh, Carla Raymond Kid, but Carla is sort of my mentor, and uh, Carla has set up something. She, you know, she has a team of people. Um, she has, you know, she handles real estate, but she also has accountants who work with her. She has attorneys who work with her. She has lenders 
who work with her so that when they are dealing, they're trying to anticipate these kinds of problems. That's a really good way. And so, you know, it's, you know, the, these guys at this conference that you spoke to earlier today, you know, if you don't have those things kind of lined up, that's a way that you can possibly avoid some headaches in the future. You know, Money Corp, you know, one of the things was we can't move money or the exchange rate. That's what Money Corp does. You know, we can't get financing. You know, you have these guys. It, it is difficult. It's more challenging to get financing for international purchasers. So if you have people who know how to do that, that's important to do. You know, um, so you kind of anticipate the headaches that they have. Um, one of the other things I'm going to mention, uh, just kind of briefly, a couple of things is this isn't so much a barrier to their investment as it is um, a barrier to working with them. And that is you have to think about um, their language. Um, if at all possible, most people are going to prefer to do business in their language. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I am saying that you should think about that, especially if you are marketing to that group if you're trying to market to that group, you want to try to do marketing in their language. And you also want someone who is a native from those areas to review it and make sure that it's saying what it is you want to say. Um, another thing to think about is sort of availability. So um, uh, George Schmiel mentioned this as well, and that is you know, just getting on the internet. I think it, we kind of take for granted that we can put stuff on the internet and that it is you know, covered. But that's not necessarily true. You have to put it places where people can find it. And so you need to think about that when you're marketing to these groups. Um, and, and this isn't in my group, but for instance, in China, of course, there's a big firewall. And so just putting stuff on our internet will not get seen over there. You have to make sure that you're on that side. So um, I'm going to do a quick wrap up. I've probably been running long, uh, sort of the 2022 outlook that we were given. The global economy is expected to grow at 3.5%. Uh, the US economy is expected to grow at 3.2%. We expect to see more housing starts. They're expecting to see 1.68 million housing starts in 2022. Uh, price appreciation of homes is expected to slow to a, to a moderate, more 3.1%. And maybe the biggest single thing, which we mentioned a little bit further, that in terms of international um, real estate sales is the return of China to our market. So um, I'm going to kind of end abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my notes. I just kind of threw things together, things that were on my mind. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, I don't know where we are on time, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, David. Currently, I do not see any questions in the chat box, but if you do have any questions, please type them in the chat box. And uh, David, if you could please stay for the next 10 minutes and hopefully we can answer in the, in the chat box. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the, our next speaker is Liana Bogert, our NAR Global Coordinator for South America. She is a broker associate at Remax Affinity Plus in Marco Island, Florida. After getting her license in 2010, she obtained her first NARCIPS designation in the summer of 2010. Since then, she has been involved and as part of the NAR Global Business and Alliances and serving since 2002. She is NAR faculty member instructor for the CIPS, ABR, and SRS designations. She's a member of NAR Global Business Alliance Advisory Board, Global Business Alliance Committee, member and a 2020 president of Marco Island Area Association of Realtors and 2021 Florida Realtors Global Council member, among others. In 2005, Ileana moved to the USA and settled in Marco Island, Florida and decided to get her real estate license in 2010. Since then, she has been involved in the international real estate. After extensive traveling and living abroad, she relates and understands the importance of international business culture. She easily connects with her international customer space and enjoys working with foreign buyers. 
sellers, and investors to help them achieve their real estate dreams. She's fluent in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. She has lived in Mexico, New York, Ohio, Brazil, and born and raised in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. Let's welcome our South America and our global coordinators, Ileana Bogues. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. Thank you, the uh, West Valley San, San Gabriel Valley Association of Realtors. It's a pleasure to be here. It's very exciting all this communication, all this information that we have received. It's going to be very hard following up with uh, Mark and also uh, David with all this detailed information. But I'm just going to, uh, if you allow me, I'm going to share um, the screen. Okay. Well, I'm going to, after all, all these detailed information, so I'm going to be more uh, a brief and we're going to be a pretty much summarize uh, the things that has been said uh, in my region. I'm the global coordinator for uh, South America. Um, we have, as you know, as they have mentioned, we have our, this is our team. Uh, this is the region that I oversee. We have uh, eight countries and we have worked with the, my glo uh, three global ambassadors with Emi Kakasi, that she has Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay, which is the South Cone, South America, uh, Gonzalo, which oversees Peru and Ecuador, and Larry Sibeci, who, who oversees um, Brazil and um, Colombia. And obviously our staff uh, director, okay, which is Alejandro Scudero and Betsy Sachs. Why would do we do this? Uh, and it's very important that we uh, know that these uh, um, tools are your, uh, for you to take advantage and grow your business, right? So we know that NER, as Mark mentioned, and as uh, David mentioned, we have more than a um, partnership, cooperating associations in more than 72 countries, uh, 100 organizations that they only, NER only does uh, alliances, partnership with countries that they have a similar uh, code of ethics, right? So that way you feel comfortable uh, referring uh, your customers to, to them so they can be treated as well as you treated here in the United States. We actually are, uh, the, the, the message that we're sending is the power of the realtor brand. We wanna grow the, uh, the membership globally because that way we can build that bridge uh, where we can actually have that connection that we can actually do business from realtor to realtor. So we are all working, that's our goal, that's our uh, global coordinators, global ambassadors, that's the mission that we share. And we would like to provide this information to, to you here in, in the US that to use to get to know what you, you have at your um, disposal so you can actually connect and use it and be, feel, be more comfortable. These are the associations, the cooperating associations. Again, these are the countries where we are located. These are the uh, partnerships, uh, the strategic partners that we have in, the, uh, in these countries. So the countries that I receive is Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, and these are the populations. And David uh, was right, one of the uh, Brazil, uh, actually there's uh, the countries that they are actually, there's a lot of, uh, they have money, they have, they have actually a lot of money and the growth the number one was Brazil in, in um, GDP. In uh, Latin America, the number one who leads it is Brazil, but you can see the, the size of um, uh, uh, their uh, population. Uh, Mexico have 120 million um, um, in populations, and Brazil have 212 million. So it's a different, but yes, it is significant. Number three is Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Peru, and, Equ and Ecuador. And uh, we have talked about this, the report that when, uh, David mentioned about, it was just released a couple of weeks ago, that we have a $54 billion in a foreign investment. And most of those transactions are uh, cash transactions and the desktop destinations, right? That was uh, Florida, California, Texas, um, New York and New Jersey. And the top five are Canada, Mexico, China, India, and the UK. I have to say the number five last year was uh, Colombia. And we can see the, due to uh, maybe instability and we're ha um, having in the country or COVID as well, this now, and obviously the UK recovering after Brexit. So we actually, actually they gained an, again back their number, their position as, the, as top of the five uh, countries, foreign buyers in the US. Um, 
this is interesting that I, in this report got my attention because as you know, as uh, Tom mentioned, I started my career in 2000 um, in real estate. In 2010, I got my license and I have seen this, uh, you know, that history of those um, invest foreign, uh, the foreign investing in the US. And you can see that at one point we were at one, uh, $153 billion in a foreign transactions, right? And then we are slowly going, uh, going down, it's a trend. Hopefully with everything that way, uh, obviously after COVID and after, you know, the stability, political situation, hopefully in different countries, we can actually start working towards going up the hill again. And um, as I mentioned, uh, here are the uh, the buyers that invest in the uh, top states, or maybe the, the 10 um, states that are actually uh, foreign buyers are investing in Florida, California, Texas, Arizona, New Jersey, New York, and then it's North Carolina, Ohio, uh, Georgia, and um, I believe it's uh, Minnesota. And um, here and you can see, and I'm gonna go narrow down a little bit here because uh, you can see in Mexico, it's, uh, it's part of North America, but in, in uh, South America, it's belong to my, my, the, my region. And we have um, the Latin American countries investing in the US, Argentina, Colombia, and, and Brazil. So it's something that um, even though the numbers or we're not in the top five and everything, we actually have a uh, presence through our um, investment in the US. And, um, and I think uh, David um, went through this, the major foreign buyers purchase um, properties in which states. We are um, in my region, we'll see it in Florida, you can see a very um, um, high percentage of investment from South American countries which is uh, from the, the top five, four of them comes from, uh, from South America, which are Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, Venezuela, and number five is uh, yeah, Canada. But if you see in other regions, um, in other states, we actually have the countries that in Texas, uh, predominant, I will say, or, or the highest percentage, we're not gonna say that the only ones, right? The higher percentage will be uh, Mexico, Florida, as I mentioned, is, uh, is a mix of uh, South American countries, but um, California is a number, 11% of uh, um, receive foreign investment from, La from Latin America. But what I'm trying to say this is just like, I, 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 the way how I view this is an opportunity for you to identify through your global council in, um, in the association and try to find out what, which are the countries that they are actually investing in the area. And you know that we have uh, from there, even though if you wanna have a, a, a start another niche of your market. And then you can start attracting those, uh, those bees because I can guarantee you that even in California and Arizona, and uh, even though maybe, uh, or, or Texas, you think that is Mexico, but I can tell you that there will be uh, other countries that they will actually from South America, from Latin America, that they're investing. I know, and so, and also who is actually uh, living in your, um, in your state, in those states, that they actually are ready for all these countries that they can actually bring families or investment opportunities back to the area. So this is, um, I said, here in uh, New, uh, New York and New Jersey, I was gonna say it's a mix of uh, Latin, uh, also of Latin America and the Caribbean that they're actually investing. Well, for example, the, um, the Dominican Republic, uh, uh, Colombia also. So it's actually some opportunities for us to analyze this. We're not only gonna say, okay, if here in California is only, but I'm just going, China is the major uh, buyer. I'm just going to uh, direct my attention to those, uh, to that market, right? So I think it's important to start looking and analyzing how we're gonna grow my business before everybody else is start doing um, the same, right? So um, some of the things that are here, uh, from, from where are these leads coming, right? So for how can we attract this? And I put a highlight here um, in red because um, personal contacts. When we go and attend these exactly webinars, now before we just used to do it in a live, right, in present, where we go away to go to a trade mission to connect with, uh, with those uh, person face to face, but now we'll do it here. So we have to follow up 
and then try to attend as, as, as much or as many as we can to these uh, webinars, to these uh, virtual trade missions that we're doing. Um, the websites, uh, obviously, uh, David went through this, and um, business contacts outside the US. Uh, we have presentations that right now we have a, a phenomenal panelists about you know, immigration, about uh, uh, foreign, uh, about exchange rate for money corp. But how can we actually find those on the other side so get, make us uh, ourselves more familiar? So how can we actually start uh, referring and networking with them so we can, when we uh, an opportunity arise, then we can actually go feel comfortable and refer our, our customers to them. What we're doing here in, uh, um, in, my, in my region, and it's something that we're talking about um, our, our, the country, about the culture, about the beauty of the, con uh, the, co uh, the country, and uh, we actually were featuring our international realtors. So that way we are having, having them connect with the U.S. realtors um, in, uh, in the area who like to participate. So that way they start building that, you have your, uh, your contact in, this, in these countries. So for us, it's very important that we can actually reach out to all these global councils. So you guys have present this information to your, uh, to your members. So that way they can feel more comfortable and more actually knowing about when the opportunity uh, arrives, they know who to contact, they know who to, um, where to go and how to get that information, which co cooperating association NAR has an agreement in this country. We are seeing in this, uh, those statistics, statistics that we have shown that Mark has said that David went over. Uh, NAR is uh, it's, it's giving us all those tools for us to grow our business. It's our job to actually inform in, um, in our membership to have, okay, here, here, here it is, this is the channel that you need to follow and try to keep this um, between uh, realtor to realtor, so uh, professionals, what I'm saying is what we're trying to do is through professionals, because we know that there's investment is coming, buyers are coming, and the best way to actually um, serve those customers is through channel to a professional. And, um, I forgot here to mention in our country, it is uh, in, the profession is regulated. In Brazil, the profession is regulated by the government, right? In Chile, it was regulated uh, at one point. It's not regulated, but we follow this partnership with uh, the Cooperating Association. And uh, Brazil has 400,000 members um, uh, uh, in the, in, within the association. And uh, they do, they, uh, we have the two cooperating associations with the office in Secovi that they serve uh, the residential commercial side. Um, Colombia is not, the profession is not regulated currently. They're working to uh, regulate the profession, which is very important for us. Um, uh, again, when we are doing referring these, um, our customers, Peru is a, is a regular, regulated profession, uh, Ecuador, same Argentina, you need to have a university degree in order to, um, you know, in order to work and uh, put an affiliated to an, uh, an association and it, it is required. If you don't have a university degree, then you need to be same as we do the under uh, the supervision of a broker who, who has a, a bachelor degree. Okay, and Paraguay, I'm sorry, Paraguay is not uh, regulated nor Uruguay. Um, what happened during COVID? During COVID, obviously, all these countries, we are same as uh, worldwide, globally, we were affected, right? Um, and then most, but most of this country, they actually have travel ban and they have a really strict protocol uh, and guidelines to follow. Um, most of these countries, uh, they will require their, their travel ban has been lifted. Um, you can actually, uh, they, they do require the negative COVID test, but um, they're, now they are, you can travel, you can visit. I know they're great, it's a great opportunity for, um, for us. And this is a, like, just like David uh, uh, mentioned um, before, this has the, um, in order to recover, 
um, there's it's going to take a couple of years to recover and uh, all the implementation and guidance that they're actually taking over. And in some countries, due to political and stability uh, situations, the opportunities arise in real estate and also the exchange rate. So it will be a great opportunity, same as many of these countries, like right now, I want to say Colombia and Argentina, are actually taking their money investment and bring it over to the US. Also, there's a great opportunity for US looking to diversify, diversify their portfolio or looking for, for a lifestyle, like a reason, um, looking to invest overseas for a vacation home. This is a great, great opportunity to, um, to buy a property. I was gonna say Brazil has a golden visa right now where you can buy a property by the, uh, on the water in the Northeast side of uh, the country for uh, like less than $200,000. And um, in, in Ecuador as well, Peru as well. So it's an opportunity for, for if, if possible, so you take the money, invest in this country. That's why Mexico received a great, um, the, uh, a great uh, investment from, uh, from I'm gonna say not only the US, from Europe and uh, Ecuador as well. There's uh, about 8,000, 10,000 expats living in, uh, in one part of Ecuador, which is Cuenca, Colombia. I know uh, 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 I have no friends and we put them in contact the US uh, by investing in the country. So I believe this is the job that we do as a global coordinator of global ambassadors. We are actually um, providing information to uh, the global council, to the membership, to your member. So what do you need? Tell us what do you need so we can help you grow your, um, grow your business. Okay. And uh, this uh, again, that's the studies that we were going through. Um, the webinars that we uh, held every other week. Uh, next week is going to be Chile. It's a, Chile is one, another uh, fabulous country, very stable, and uh, where you can buy great properties over there. So you want to know about the country. Uh, we have the next presentation is uh, next week on Thursday, three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And over there, you can uh, network with, uh, with the local realtors and you can learn about the country. The other way that we can actually, um, other ways that you can actually uh, learn about these countries is about attending the, the conference right now. You can, from the comfort of your home and your office, you can actually log in and there are most of them that are virtual or even hybrid. They're up, you can be live, can go uh, live or you can go uh, virtually. And the next one is uh, in Colombia, August 24, 27. Um, uh, and also the next one is the Confederation of uh, um, Real Estate in Latin America, which is September 9 and 10. And uh, Brazil, if you would like to experience the beauty of the country, is in uh, Foz de Iguazu, which is bordering with Paraguay. And it's, um, it's uh, September 13 and 18, sorry. And then obviously if um, God allows us, it, we can all travel and be there and exchange back to normal, hopefully, and exchange uh, our business cards with it. Um, in our country, it's mostly is uh, the only country that speaks uh, a different language is Brazil, which speaks Portuguese, and the other countries speak um, Spanish. And besides most, most of the countries, uh, the religions is uh, Catholic or Christian. Um, and basically that's, um, we wanted to be grow the power of the brand, the realtor family. And uh, that will be, as I think, as David and Mark has said, we is, that's our main goal. And we would like to uh, help all of you attending today to build that uh, referral network that um, with the countries of your, that you have uh, interest. And uh, that's my uh, report. If you have any question, how to connect, how to, how to attend those webinars, um, who do you contact if you have any specific questions, and this is our team. And um, we will be more than happy to help you succeed in this country. Thank you, Eliana. I was just about to ask that there was one question from Frederick Merga saying, is there a link to subscribe for the South American webinars? But I guess to Frederick, please email Eliana's team to subscribe. 
Right. Um, and so this is very important. Also, it is everything is if you're a CIPS, uh, it is uh, we actually um, posted on the CIPS. We posted on NAR in Espanol. And, uh, and uh, same as uh, David said, don't be afraid to reach out if you want to know, because all these countries, they have uh, uh, English speaking or any other French or any other language that you need, but don't be afraid, even though um, you can find your local somebody to help you. And, and don't forget the best um, is to serve your customer. The more that you know, the know about the country, you will feel more comfortable when, when an opportunity or when an inquiry or lead arrive, you can say, pick up the phone, then you can go to and find out the, the cooperating association. And then if you go to global alliances, you can see, or the global ambassador, you can see who is the cooperating association. And then you can feel very comfortable to pick up the phone if you would like a, a, an IRM, international realtor who speak your language, who speak, who has a specific design, designation, you can find it and honestly that you will be very comfortable the more that you know about the country that you would like to do business the better you will feel more comfortable um, referring your customer and uh, or working with a local professional a local realtor thank you very much Juliana I would like to thank our three speakers Mark Kitabayashi David McCoy and Liana Bagert for making such a wonderful presentation on our global investment trends in the Asia Pacific, North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. We really appreciate for their presentation and their answers to any questions that we have in the chat box. Now let's move on our to our lucky drawing session. Mauricio, please start the drawing. Okay, thank you so much. In small world, Ileana, what a pleasure. Um, I'm actually from Merida, Yucatan myself, so. Oh, no way, really? No way. <laughs> small world, small world. I know. And that maybe yeah. that's a great opportunity. And a lot of foreigners are living there, Europeans, they are Canadians, Americans. <laughs> yeah, let's all go. Let's all go for sure. Um, OK, if I can get some help from the from the association. Um, are we going to spin the wheel, or how are we doing this? OK, there it is. Yay, Lindy Fong is our first winner. Congratulations, Lindy. Is Thank Lindy you. there? Is Lindy is joining us still? Yes. Yes, she yes, is. Winner, winner. Please type in your email address in the chat box so we can email the gift card to you. Thank you. OK. Here we go. Who's gonna win? Who's gonna win? Mike Stone is our next winner. Congratulations. Is Mike joining us still? I saw him earlier. Okay, Mike, once, going twice, going three times. Okay, let's respin then. Okay. Okay. Jessica Hahn, are you joining us, Jessica? Are you on the call? Prompt us on the chat box if you could. I don't see, I don't see her name. Okay. Okay. And I know I know we're we're short of time, so we'll we'll keep moving. How many do we have, um, Mo? We have two more. Two. Ida Santiago. I don't Not see good. her name either. Okay. All right. Keep moving. Eve, Eve Green. Eve, are you still there? Okay. Next. Okay. One more. All right. We have Frankie Ho. Frankie, show us you're Next. here. Next. All right. I see him all the time. <laughs> well, you know, the realtors, uh, real estate professionals. Oh my gosh. Wendy Cohen is here. Let's get Wendy then. 
<laughs> Thomas Wong. Thomas Wong. I don't see his name. Oh, Thomas here. Thomas is here. Okay, winner, winner. Okay. Look, so Thomas we have, Wong, um, we have one more. Name. We have one more. You have, you have to click on the attendees, and I, I, oh. I found him. Okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thomas, so we know where to find you. <laughs> one more. I mean, we have lab demo. One more. Show. One more, son. One more. Okay, Ray John. Ray, are you joining us? Next. Okay. Before we spinning, um, I have a question because I did throw two questions earlier. Sure. Um, the first question is, what is the name of the form that uh, we need to submit it to ESCO as soon as we get the file? Now, I know Mindy got halfway right, um, not exact name. Um, I was looking for the name, it's called FERCTA. Now, I know 593 is also one of the forms that sent in. Um, can we accept that or st should we look for the exact name, FERCTA? Mo? We, were they close? <laughs> were they They're close? close. Yeah, well, of, yeah, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, I say. Okay, yeah, then um, then that, that um, we can give it to Mindy then in that case. Fantastic, fantastic. So we got Absolutely. all the gift cards. Okay, well, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you again to all our, all our sponsors that made these gift cards possible. Obviously, wonderful event. Um, Shun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mauricio. Well, our three hours... Our three hour of fun time has come to the end. On behalf of the West Singapore Valley Realtors, we'd like to thank all our panelists for informing us the latest global update, update in loan process, escrow, immigration, visa, and global investment trends. Our special thanks to all our audience and realtors who participated in this summit and congratulations to all the winners who won the gift card today. Our annual summit certainly helped give a gauge of what is happening in the United States with holding property in terms of title, FERPTA, foreign buyers, immigration laws, transferring money out of the US or transferring out, uh, transferring into the US um, and even referrals with the other countries. As you know, real estate is one of the driver in the e economy um, around the world. It is important to have the updates and understanding of what and how to answer your clients' questions intelligently. So I hope you enjoy our summit. This session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, West Singapore Valley Realtors. So again, thank you everyone for joining our section today. This section now adjourned. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you next time. <laughs>